everybody welcome back it is friday that means it's the friday free for all it's our notre dame mailbag day that means today you all get to decide the topics that we are going to discuss today that is ryan roberts our director of recruiting draft expert and all-around good guy i'm your publisher brian driscoll not so much uh, so we're going to dive into our questions today. Ryan and I were kind of going through this. We got a little distracted. We started late, not because we were purposely being late like we normally are. We went a little longer because we were reading through all the good questions. We're like, that's a good question. That's a good question. Like, oh, we might want to start the show now. So now we are going to start the show. And Ryan, we what else better way to start a show on a Friday than to talk about quarterbacks, right? And so we're going to talk about with negative KD. It says, Brian, Buck, Tyler Buckner seems to have a bit of a low release point. As the resident QB guru, if you're his coach, would you be concerned with that? Negative KD, by the way. I have a th- my my theory on quarterback mechanics has always been this. I will mess with a quarterback's footwork until he gets it right. That is my philosophy. I will mess with a quarterback's core use if he's not using it or whatever until he gets it right. I'm not messing with a kid's throwing mechanics other than just trying to enhance the the his release point. Because some quarterbacks no matter what their throwing motion is, their release point can get out of whack. And that's just a timing thing. And maybe you can have them grip the ball differently to help improve the release point. The only, That's really the only upper body thing I may work with is maybe altering how he grips the ball because it will enhance his throwing motion. Otherwise, I don't care about a quarterback's throwing motion. I care about his results. And the, and the results are what, Ryan? Can you get the ball out quickly? Can you get the ball out accurately? And, accurately, and can you get the ball? can you get enough velocity on the ball to get the job done? Those are the three things I care about. And whether you're, you know, Drew Brees with a perfect over-the-top motion, whether you're F- Philip Rivers who throws it sidearm and everything in between, can you throw it accurately? Can you throw it quickly? And can you throw it enough velo- with enough enough velocity to get the get it to where it needs to get to? That's all I care about. And the only time that it would be an issue to have a low release is if you're throwing quick game. But the reality is when you're throwing quick game, if you're a 6'4 quarterback and the other team has a bunch of Keon Keeleys and Jason Moores and Brandon Vernons and Bubakars on the other side, they're still taller than you, right? And so they can get their hands up. You're throwing through throwing lanes anyway. You're looking for space to throw the ball to. It doesn't affect you at all on on more downfield stuff. Uh, Any quarterback that's going to try to throw through a defensive end who's 6'4 is going to get their ball batted down. That's just the reality of it. So I don't really care, to be honest with you, uh, about the throwing motion as long as it gets the job done. And and that's what I didn't like. Now, Notre Dame has been tinkering with his mechanics, but the tinkering they're doing is getting him back to his comfort zone after he had changed him as a senior in high school. So that's been what Coach Reese has been working with over the last year is getting him back to his comfort zone. He doesn't – I mean, if Tommy Reese was – trying to get Tyler Buckner to throw the way he wanted to throw, it would look nothing like it does now. He's not messing with it. It's let's clean it up and get him back to his comfort zone, Ryan. And that's just, that's just one of those things where I, I know it's a always a talking point. Oh, what's his release look like? What's his release look like? I just don't care. And I have 30 years of watching quarterbacks playing with all types of different throwing motions to realize it doesn't matter. It, the, the end result is all that matters, not how you get there. Yeah. I mean, with so many different types of, body types now at the quarterback position heights. I mean, I care if you can find a window, right? And Mm -hmm. for that, I mean, that's why everyone goes bonkers for the throwing from different platform stuff now, right? So either way, I mean, a lot of quarterbacks are just kind of changing their platform regardless. But I mean, I care about, I want release quickness. And for me, that's not changing a release point as much as that is just follow through, right? Like Mm -hmm. kind of the consistent getting to your follow through motion, I want a good base. Like you said, Brian, I want to make sure that my lower body and my upper body are aligned as much as possible. There's going to be some times when you're navigating chaos where that's impossible, but I want to get those things aligned. I want to make sure the the feet are working with me and I want to have a consistent and compact release that is going into a follow through. Like I want that part of the deal because as long as you're following through the release quickness should kind of fix itself a little bit. And I think the biggest thing you said that I agree with 100% is comfort, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you when you're teach when you're I mean especially a throwing motion, man. I mean for Tyler Buckner's entire life, I'm sure he's been a quarterback the majority of his life. His release has been the same, the same, the same. And then all of a sudden you completely try to change everything, and that's a lot of years of muscle memory, man. And that's a hard time to deprogram and reprogram. So, I am also not big into the release thing. I mean, I, one of my favorite quarterbacks ever was Philip Rivers. So you yeah. already talked about mm-hmm. that was most unorthodox quarterback 
of all time. I mean, when you're talking about it, you think about Bernie Kosar had like a similar type of release, right? Like those things are not traditional, but as long as it gets to the right spot, what does it actually matter at the end? It's more about the end result. The process is always going to be different for quarterbacks. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from coming from with Philip Rivers, but as a Broncos fan, I just can't. I can't fair. with Philip Rivers. I can't. But he's uh, so he's, he's such a tough guy though, man. I he big it. time, big time. Yeah. But you know, like you said, he was a very accurate quarterback and it, you know, it's it just is ma- the release points of what matters, not how you get there. So yes. as long as that as long as the results are, are good, Tyler Buckner's gonna be fine. John A1 asks who are you putting on the field facing an opponent offense in 22 personnel inside the five? Who's in Notre Dame? Who in Notre Dame's defense? Who's in Notre Dame's defense? Big package. So 22 personnel, for those who don't know, is two tight ends, two running backs, and one receiver. You could also go 23 personnel. So inside the five yard line, John, or Ryan, they've got two tight ends, two backs in the backfield. What is your Notre Dame personnel going to look like? I mean, so I'm either going to run a five-man or a six-man front, depending on what the general flow of the game is, John. I mean, it's it's a tough question because I kind of need, like, what is the, the flow of the game? And it's, like, something that's, like, not – it's not easy to quantify all the time, you know, it's just because kind of – that's, like, the the – that's like the tough part of coaching, in my opinion, Brian, is that like sometimes it's you can't really explain why you did something. It's just like kind of a feeling, right? Like it's just like, oh, I, I need to do that right now. Like it's not as much like a reactive. It's more like a proactive type of feel to like how you coach. But if I'm working in a five-man front, I would like to get a little beef on the field. I mean, that this is really dependent on Gabriel Rubio, Jason Onye. Either one of those guys can play a high level of football. I'm going to get one of them on the field for sure. There's no doubt about it. It's kind of getting a bigger package on there. So one of them will be at the nose. I probably have Jason Adam Malola will definitely be on the field. There's no Mm -hmm. doubt about it. So I'd have him. I'd probably go with Jacob Lacey just because he's got a little more size comparative to a Howard Cross. So Cross would probably be off the field. And then I would have Riley Mills and, of course, Isaiah Foskey on the field as well. So that would probably be my five man front. I would probably have some form of a 5-3. So I would have, in this instance, I would probably bring in Bo Bauer off the field. So I'd have some combination of Bo Bauer, J.D. Bertrand, and Maris Loifal. And then my single high safety in the middle of the field would be a Brandon Joseph and then obviously my two corners. But obviously in this situation, we want to get some size on the field. So it's a necessity for me to get either one of Onye or a Gabriel Rubio on the field that can give you a little more beef. I cannot believe you didn't have Junior Chuel Mock on in your in your lineup. I'm I'm offended and hurt. It's, it's either him or Bo, <laughs> man. I went with the experience. It's okay, I get you. I get you. And Coach, you know this, Brian, Bo Bauer. If you tell him to crash an A or a B yes. gap, and that's your responsibility, oh, yeah. yes, 100 sir. miles an hour, he's going to hit it <laughs> like a. We have a question about World War II tanks. He's going to hit it like a <laughs> tank, and yes. like a Sherman tank. He's going to crush that thing. No question about it. Coach Bent 574, in my opinion, Chase Claypool is the last complete wide receiver, blocking and receiver we've had. Out of only wide receivers, not, not so mayor, who is the closest to being a dominant complete receiver? So you, your second part of your question says dominant complete receiver. The first part just says the last complete receiver. I will actually disagree with your comment. I thought Javon McKinley in 2020 was a very good player. His numbers per targets were outstanding. He just wasn't targeted as much as Chase was. The offense didn't throw it as much as it did in 2019. But when given opportunities, he was great. And the other thing about Javon in 2020, even though his numbers don't come close to matching Chase, go look at every big game Notre Dame played in that year. Javon was really good. And even in games where he didn't get his numbers didn't look good, like against Bama, Clemson, and the ACC title game, he was getting open. He just wasn't getting the football. He was great against Clemson. He was great against North Carolina. He really stepped up that year, and he was a beast as a blocker, Ryan. So I would say last complete receiver they had was Javon McKinley. Now, being the complete dominant receiver, I don't think Javon was dominant the way the chase was by any stretch. So I'll go with you there. I just – who's the closest to being a dominant complete receiver? I don't think they really have that kind of guy. I don't think Deion Colsey's anywhere close to being that kind of guy. I don't – I don't think Tobias would be that kind of guy as a freshman. I think Tobias will eventually get there because he's an effort guy in the run game. He just needs to get stronger and keep filling out. So I'd say probably Tobias and and Dion would be the only two that could be in that conversation. I mean, Braden Lindsay's not going to be that guy. Lorenzo Styles isn't going to be that guy. He's not going to go throw around cornerbacks. No, he'll he'll be he's a good blocker as a freshman. 
But right. as far as like the kind of dominance you're talking about, where you're talking about like Chase Claypool, the bigger bodied guys, I don't think there is that guy. I know who that guy is going to be in three years, though, Ryan, and he's not on the current roster. You know exactly who I'm talking about. That's Who's the dominant? Ass. Yes, yes. Just because the body type, just the all around game, you know, he's going to be their most ferocious blocker in three. I mean, well, I mean, say three years, I'm just giving him time to get into the rotation. He'll yep. be their best blocker. The, I don't know what what day is he going to step foot on campus. Whatever day that is, that's the day that he becomes the best blocker on this on this on the wide receiver depth chart. Yeah, man. Uh, he uh, and that's why I really love Jane Greathouse. If I'm being honest, because he just has kind of that like ferocious personality, right? Like he's such a nut. But I mean, we had him on the show, right? And he's just like a, such a polite, nice kid. But then on the field, he's just like I'm putting you in the dirt, <laughs> and, and I love it, man. And I'll give Chase all the credit in the world. Chase Claypool, he. I mean, he was a massive kid, obviously, right? Like 6'4", 230 plus pounds, and he would, you know, dog some dudes for sure. Jaden Greathouse has just kind of that demeanor to him that I, that mm-hmm. I agree that he could definitely be that guy. Braylon James maybe could be that guy in the future if, when he starts adding some weight and doing all that type of stuff. But I, I agree, like the most clean projection would probably be a great house. Tobias is interesting, though, because I, I actually did notice some of his uh, – some of his highlights where I thought he did put give really good effort as a blocker. And I think for, for this question, you're definitely looking for like the bigger body type. Cause I mean, like you said, Lorenzo styles can block, like he, it's mm-hmm. fine, but it's just not like, you know, he's not going to manhandle dudes at the point yeah. of attack. Like it's just not, he's, he's more of a stock blocker getting a good position and having effort in that department. So yeah. uh, it always nice to have that type of guy though. Cause they, they set some tone when they, you remember uh, Terrell Owens? He was like mm-hmm. one of the best blocking wide receivers I've ever seen, man. He would absolutely destroy dudes in the run game. Yep. Heinz Ward, even though he was smaller, would destroy dudes in the run game. Yep. I love those types of players. We're going to keep answering questions, but while we're talking about questions, we are going to pull up the practice video from today and just let you guys kind of watch a little bit of the practice video. It's like three minutes long while we're, while we're talking. So for those of you who didn't see it, uh, we'll let you get a chance to watch it. So the next question, Ryan, is from John Klimek. He said, is there an alpha wide receiver in the current group? I think there's I, I potential think for several, Ryan. I mean, yeah, there's potential for several. Yeah. No, I, and I think that, John, this is the big difference between, I mean, like the last question is asking us about being a dominant blocker and fixture as a wide receiver. That's kind of why hesitancy to include Lorenzo Styles in there just because of the size aspect. But I think Lorenzo could be an alpha. I do. I mean, I think that he's a guy that can dominate from all over the formation. Brian mentions Tobias Merriweather as a guy that I think could be that guy as well. Like he could be an alpha. He could be a lead dog for a, you know, a good passing attack. If Deion Colsey ever takes a step, he could be that guy from a talent perspective. There's no doubt at all. So yeah, I think that there's several on the team right now. And I would also say that there's, a couple in the 2023 recruiting class that Notre Dame has committed right now that I could see being alphas. I could see Brandon James being an alpha. I could see Jaden Greathouse being an alpha. Those are that those types of personalities that are in the room. So yeah, I think there's several guys, John, that could be that guy. Uh, Lorenzo Styles closest now. I think Tobias Merriweather is the next after that. I think I think Lorenzo has a chance over the next year to emerge as that guy. Ryan's talked about it. I think Tobias takes over after that at some point in time. And I could even see it being a situation where in, in, in 2023, you know, we're having a similar conversation like my, me and my buddy, Tim O'Malley, who, who writes for Irish illustrated really good guy. We have all these different debates and I, I love talking football with Tim. Uh, but we've had a debate for, I don't know, years about who was better golden Tater, Michael Floyd. We still have that debate, you know, and, and I could see it being a situation in 2023 where we are having that conversation with Lorenzo and, and Tobias. And I think that's a great place to be in, Ryan, is when you are having that discussion of, of who really is the alpha, not because I don't know who it is. I, none of these guys are alphas to where, I don't know, this guy's really good. Yeah, but this guy's really good. I think that's where Notre Dame, it, like when the Notre Dame offense truly arrives, it'll be that. Because yeah. we're having conversations about which one of these dudes is the best. Like you could have, a, you know, who was the best guy at Alabama? Was it Jalen Waddle, State. Jerry Judy? Was it Devonte Smith? You know what I mean. And same thing with Ohio State. You know, you'll, you'll most people I think should say Garrett Wilson. Some will say Chris Olave. Well, what what about Michael Thomas? Well, hey, Devin Smith is the only one with a ring. You know that kind of thing. So uh, those are the com- those are the places you want to be when you're talking about having those conversations. Hundred percent. John A1 says, is there any offensive scheme that Notre Dame doesn't have the personnel to run? So outside of the triple option. I mean, there... I would argue, though, that they would have the personnel if Avery? they wanted to use it. 
Avery. Talking about Avery what, Davis. What, what, yeah. what, a quarterback? Yeah. No, I mean, t- Tyler could run the triple option. No. No. With uh, with Aldrick Estime as the dive back, and then you have no. Chris Tyree no. coming around on the, <laughs> no, the he, motion. No, he probably oh, could. Man. He probably could. Yeah, he, he probably could. could. He could. I I don't think um don't have the pro- no. I think they have the. Pro- I mean, look, if they wanted to go to a a pro style offense, I think they. I think like meaning like old school pro style, so fullback, tight end. I mean, there's things they could do. They have fullbacks on the roster now. Mm-hmm. You know, you saw in some of the clips from today's. Well, we didn't actually put them in the practice video, but there was practice video that I couldn't because we can only put three minutes. There was practice video in there that you were seeing them go through. Like what one of the drills they'll do is they'll just kind of work on handoff technique. So it's just the quarterback, the running backs, and they just work on their. You know, they'll put like cones down or remember the uh, the fire hoses. I don't know if they yeah. still have those or not, but like the fire hoses, uh, which has like the guard and then the space and then the tackle, then the space and all that. And then you just work, kind of work on your aiming points, you know, hey, work on your aiming point, thing like that. I never loved that drill, to be honest with you, as a coach, because it it never works that way. Like, the line doesn't just stay there. I always like kind of starting it with a bag, and then, like, the bag would work, and then you had to press the bag. I always kind of felt that was a more practical drill for running backs. Different conversation for a different day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you you between those fullbacks you have on the rush, the walk-ons, between, you know, Kevin Bauman, Kane Barong, you know, the tight end depth chart, I think there's plenty of things you could do with a sort of a second a fullback type of look. Uh, you could you – know, the, the only question I would have is, you know, you'd be somewhat limited a little bit on some of the pass game stuff because most of your receivers are on the small side would would be a concern. But, like, running back-wise, you can handle that. I mean, put Aldrick Estimate back there if you want to. You know, give me two running backs who can do it. And, and then I think the only other one is is a is a run and shoot would be a little tough for Notre Dame right now just because of depth at receiver. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about a four receiver offense and you got six healthy receivers or seven healthy, you know, That's six exactly. healthy receivers because Joe Wilkins is out. So I was going to say yeah. the air raid is one yeah. that'd be just a little tough. Yeah. Well, yeah. the the reason I'll say no to the air raid is mm-hmm. I'd have, you'd have to specify the Mike Leach version of the air raid, because I think a good air raid coach would look at his tight end depth chart and say, I can use Eli Raritan in, in this role. I can like, use Kane like Barong. Phil, like Phil Longo's kind of done at points. He's done yeah, a really like good that. job with that. Like, really yeah. good job with that. Mike uh, uh, Lincoln Riley has used fullbacks, tight ends a lot in his version of the air raid. So, sure. but the Mike Leach version, Notre Dame can't run that for the same reason, like the old school run and shoot would be one that they couldn't do, right? So, that's a, a, a really good point. But it, I mean, most stuff they can do. I, the, the problem with the triple option, honestly, Ryan, would be they don't have the offensive lineman for that. Because it's an off, I mean, it's quick and under, you know, it's it's just a, yeah. they're a big, powerful offensive line. I mean, you you know, I'll tell you who would thrive in a triple option offense for Notre Dame, Emil Wagner. True. <laughs> right now, his, his his size doesn't become an issue. Emil Wagner could play tackle in a triple option offense right now. Well, Sul- Sullivan Absher is going to be in town next year, too, and he literally has played in a triple Him and Joe Odding are walking in like, yeah. I'm in my comfort zone. There's no doubt about it. I would personally quit and go find something else to do. If I had to cover the triple option every single day, I would, I'd be like, Ryan, here you're taking over, man. I'm out. I'm out. I'm going to spend the rest of my life on a beach somewhere until I run out of money, which would be like next Thursday. So uh, John, a one with another question, who would be your, uh, your out from nowhere player on offense and defense, not a star, but a key contributor like Chris Fink or Drew White burst on the scene in 2018. It's a good yeah, question. A, it's a yeah, really it's a, good one. It's a really good one. It's it's a tough one too. Yep. I out of nowhere. I mean, I, yeah, I it guess, could be a guy that doesn't play a ton, wasn't expected yeah. to be much of an impact guy. Maybe it's someone who people don't think is that good that ends up becoming a good player. You know. Do you th- do you think it's out of the realm for to fit this question that if I say to Kevin Bauman? Not at all. I think that fits. Him. I think that fits right perfectly. I mean, if he takes that number yeah. two tight end role, right? I mean, who who's talking a lot about Kevin Bauman right now? Nobody. Right. I don't even. I mean, there's not really a tight end that many people are. I mean, I guess yeah. Kane Barong a little bit, yeah. but like not really. But honestly. he said like, not a star. Yeah. That's what he said. Right. Like not a star, but a key contributor. You know, like Chris Fink yeah. was their third best receiver that year, but he was he had some money moments and some in some clutch catches. I mean, the Michigan touchdown. You know, the he had a, one of the best catches. Uh, Best throws that uh, that Ian Book ever made was that corner route to Fink against USC in 2018. If you remember that throw, that was a yeah. gorgeous throw uh, for a touchdown in the game that they were coming back from. And Chris made a great catch along the sidelines for me. And 
What's funny is he had, uh, I think, seven catches for like 100-some yards in the first half of that game. Like Chris Fink put the offense on his back in the first half of the USC game when they were down 10-0 and, and made some great, great catches and throws and uh, and helped them get back in that game. So it wasn't a star. I mean, it was Miles, it was Chase, it was Dex, you know, that kind of thing, Ian. Yeah. But yeah, I think Kevin Bauman would fit that perfectly if he's that number two guy. I'm I'm going with Zeke Carell on offense. It's a good. One. I, I just think look, he's he's never going to get the love because he's going to have Jarrett Patterson to one side. He's going to have the tackles are always going to get a ton of publicity, rightfully so. You know, Blake Fisher is always going to be the star, which rightfully so. Sure, he's always going to be a little bit overlooked, but I think he's going to be such an important integral part of this offensive line success, and then which in turn is the offense's success. If your center is not good or struggles it can jack up your whole offense. I mean, it can mess you up big time because we always talk about, Ryan, defensively, you've got to be good up the middle on all three levels. I believe the same thing to be true on on offense. If you're not good center, quarterback, and running back, you're going to have a hard time being a really successful offense. What about defense? Who's your pick on defense? It's somebody that we talked about briefly before the show started. Alexander Ahrensberger is my guy. Yeah, I – I think that he's the most natural backup at strong side defensive end, you know, to Riley Mills. I know Nana Osafa Mensa has been a guy that's played some football, but I mean, man, it's hard to not watch. It's hard to watch Alexander Ahrensberger and not get like a little juiced about like, wow, man, like he looks the part he needs to put it together. But I mean, Brian, I mean, he's working off of pure traits and he's made mm-hmm. a couple plays in his Notre Dame career, just off of pure traits. So if Al Washington has him working in the right, in a good direction, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets some work in some sub packages with his ability to have the length and rush ability. And if he's the main backup at strong side defensive end, I think, I think that's possible. So I'm going to go with Alexander Ehrensberger. The only other guy that was on the top of my head was Jacob Lacey. If he, you know, we just get like a, <clears throat> excuse me, a full kind of scope of Jacob Lacey. If he's able to stay healthy, but I'll go with Alexander Ehrensberger for this one. I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction on this one. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a corner. And it's going to either be Clarence Lewis or what my ultimate pick is, is Tariq Bracey. I think I think Notre Dame fans have pretty much kind of just written Tariq Bracey off. He just he is what he is. And, and I get that because he's kind of just been the same guy for three years now. You know, like, okay, at times, you know, really good at times. Okay, at other times, ha- we'll have some plays where you just get smoked. I From things I've heard and just kind of where I think he is, I think Tariq Bracey is a guy that's going to have a really good year. He may not make a ton of – plays where we look at and say hey look wow look what he did and he made this big play and that game changing play but you're just like man that did that guy only catch three passes for 31 yards like man what let me go back and watch the film oh yeah Tariq was on the whole game you know and and I think they're gonna need him to be that guy because there's I mean the big games we're talking about Notre Dame needing to win this year Ryan are games where it's Teams are going to spread the ball, spread the field out formationally and throw the ball and, and all those type of things. So sure. um, I think Tariq Bracey is going to be mine on defense. It's an interesting one. I feel like, mm-hmm. I mean, he's been good in spurts just during his mm-hmm. career. And I just been like really good get, at times. Yeah. I feel like he just doesn't get the love, obviously, because I mean, honestly, he was pressed into so much duty outside and he's yeah. just not a natural outside kid. Right. Yeah. Like just a lack of length. But I think he could be a really good player in the nickel to your point. He was, he was, uh, I'm trying to think, it was the Georgia game in 2019. Go back and watch the Georgia game in 2019. It's like games like that are like, that's what I think Tariq Bracey can be. It's just he can't consist, he hasn't shown the ability to consistently do it. I just think he's going to be really good this year. And I think to your point, Ryan, I actually think he could play outside in certain defenses, Mm -hmm. especially against like, I think he would have been a guy that would have been perfectly fine in outside against Ohio State last year you know, Alabama in 2020 because they're more his style of athlete. Mm -hmm. But then there's going to be games like, you know, he goes out and does great against Virginia or I mean, it's Georgia. And then he gets torched against Virginia. Why? Because remember that year, Virginia just had a bunch of monsters at receiver. You know, they just were just throwing it up and he couldn't do anything about it. And that's, that's where he gets in. USC did that to him a couple of times in 2018 as well. The only time he really had balls called him that year was just Michael Pitt. I think it was Michael Pittman. And they're just throwing it up to him, and there's nothing Tariq could do about it because he's just he's he's not tall and he's not long. It's a bad combination on the outside. It's funny because last year you might have wanted him to play outside against Ohio State, but you probably don't want that to happen this year with like Marvin Harrison Jr. and those guys playing. To your mm-hmm. point, so that's right. that's an interesting one, right? 
Yeah, so this matchup this year is not as good of a matchup as it would have been last year against Chris Olave and and Garrett Wilson. So yes, absolutely. All right, let's get uh, let's get down to some more. Real, like I said, really good questions today, Ryan. Stonador said, "What is the concern with the receiver room? It seems like we have guys with great potential. Is it a depth concern? Will Notre Dame be fine if there are no serious injuries, or do they need lots of receivers for the rotation?" For me, Ryan, I think that the, there's two concerns. Number one, depth is one. We've talked a lot about depth. And number two, it's will they be money players? And I think mm-hmm. that is the big question mark. I mean, look, you know, Lorenzo, you know, steps up as the one and, and Braden will do his thing and all those things are fine. But that 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 just gets you numbers. That beats Stanford. That beats Syracuse. To win championships, you have to be in a situation where you have you're you have money players. Who steps up in the big moments when the game is on the line? That's the big question mark for me. And I know you've talked a lot about Lorenzo Styles has the potential to be that guy, and we completely agree on that. Same with Tobias Merriweather. I think, you know, but whoever, whether it's Braden or, or Lorenzo Styles or Deion Colsey or Tobias Merriweather, or Avery Davis or whoever, Jaden Thomas, I don't care who it is, they need guys that are money players that step up when it's, you know – Chris Brown's a perfect example. Chris Brown never had great numbers, but I could name you three or four plays he made in his career that were just huge plays in big moments. I think of the Oklahoma game as a freshman, the, the phenomenal leaping grab he had in the back of the end zone against Boston College in 2015 that rescued that game that BC almost a crap BC team almost came back and won. He just made plays when he needed to. And and now he had some you know mistakes as well, but he made plays when he in big moments, and that's what that's to me the besides just numbers, that's the biggest question mark for me is who's going to step up, who's going to be that money guy that when the game's on the line they're like throw me the ball. I mean, outside of his great numbers, what often gets missed about Will Fuller, he was one of the more clutch receivers Notre Dame has had. I mean, how many get hit at least two game winning touchdowns off the top of my head in 2015, Virginia and Temple. You know, I mean, and he just – he would always answer. You know, if, if you needed a big play, he'd always answer. Stanford goes down and scores. Fuller goes for 75 on the next the next series. <laughs> That's just how he was. He was a money player for Notre Dame. Yeah. I, I have the same concerns. I mean, number one is depth. I mean, we talked about it. If there's an injury or two, then you're really starting to get into some very crisis situation from a numbers mm-hmm. perspective, in my opinion. But the biggest thing is – what you said, Brian, I have, I think there's a decent baseline. Like if Avery Davis is healthy, I know what Avery Davis is going to give me. I have pretty good understanding of what Brandon Lindsay's going to give me. I, if Lorenzo Styles is at worst, what he was at the end of the year last year, then he's a good football player. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's who's your dudes, right? Like who's right. a guy that can take a game over potentially, or make the big play in the big moment, the right. money play, like you just kind of said. Right. So I need to see who are the alphas? We had a question about alphas earlier. Is there an alpha this year? Is there a couple alphas? If there are, then you're in a good spot. But overall, my number one key concern and it's been consistent dating back to the spring is that the depth is just a big question mark with the wide receiver position still, mm-hmm. obviously. Yep. We have a super chat from Chris Irish Young. He says, first live show in a while. Thank you, Chris, for your super chat being with us. I usually only have time to watch at a later time, but wanted to send a thank you for all the great content. Chris, thank you. Really appreciate your support. It's it's uh, acts like this that really help us continue to grow and thrive, and we appreciate it very, very much. Randy Hernandez also has a super chat. Thank you, Randy, very much, very much for that. And all the others you've sent us, we appreciate it. So I know the quarterback competition is still going on, but when, you, when do you see them naming the official starter? So I want to comment on this. Look, like, Okay, there's a quarterback competition, but folks, there's no question about who the starting quarterback is going to be. It, it would have to require someone getting injured or faltering for Tyler Buckner to be starting quarterback. I, I I have a lot of people saying like things are being said, but I don't know what other people are reporting. I don't know. I don't care. I'm just telling you what we know and what we've seen is barring him just collapsing over the next three weeks or him getting injured, Tyler Buckner is going to be the starting quarterback. And I don't care, Randy, when they name him the starting quarterback. I mean, yeah, the team knows, right? They'll know. Whenever they know when it's officially decided, they'll know. But And that's all that matters. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Marcus Freeman, like a lot of other coaches, they're going to get into the whole, uh, you know, the 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 the, the uh, mental part of it. Like, oh, you know, let's play the mental games and all that, which I, I really don't think matter. I mean, I think that means more in coaches' heads than it does practically. But, I, I mean, I don't know when they'll do it. I, I would hope they would just do it in the next week. 
because what's going to happen is, is right now, if there are people talking about it, they're just talking about they're giving their opinions on what they've seen in practice, which I still don't know how anyone could have an opinion on the quarterback play when all you've seen is individual drills and stretch and special teams. Right. Uh, you know, but whatever, you gotta gotta write about something. But for me, what's gonna happen is is as you get deeper into camp and closer to the game, more and more people are gonna ask other players about it, rightfully so, because that's their job. That's not a knock on reporters, that's their job. You know, so if there's not a name starter and there's still a perceived quarterback battle, fans want to know about it. And so reporters doing their job are going to ask about it and, and write about it. Totally fine with it. Totally fair. My point is you want to try to get away from that if possible. I think that benefit is more than any potential benefit you would gain by dragging it out and, you know, maybe getting some sort of advantage over Ohio State. Ohio State, trust me, Ohio State's planning for Tyler Buckner. They are. They're game planning for Tyler Buckner. They're not game planning for Drew Pine. That's not a knock on Drew Pine. It's just Drew Pine is just going to execute the offense that they know that they're going to execute. The only thing that gets added with Tyler Buckner is the running threat. If you're game planning for Tyler Buckner, you will have game plan for Drew Pine from the passing aspect of it. you got to make sure that you're prepared to handle Tyler Buckner. So I don't think it's going to give you this big advantage, in my opinion. Uh, so the I think the bigger advantage and the bigger push for you is once you've made the ultimate decision, and you know, and you want the team to know, and more importantly, you want the players to know, the quarterbacks to know, then I would like to be, see it named so that way the players aren't getting asked to make – you can get all the Tyler questions out of the way that day in whatever press conference, and then you can hopefully move on to other things. And so that's why I would kind of like to see them do it sooner rather than later. But ultimately, I, I don't I don't care big picture when they do it. Thoughts on that, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, the – I mean, to your point, again, the players know who it is, right? right. I mean, I, I don't think that people are – I don't think players are are deaf to that to that conversation mm-hmm. that they know who the starting quarterback is going to be for Notre Dame. It's just it's, – it's, 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 I, I do think there's like a fine line between the timing sometimes because like you can't mm-hmm. preach competition and then do it too quick, right? Because then that just kind of seems like you were just kind of not – it was not a serious thing. And I do think that Marcus Freeman – truly wanted to make it wanted to make it a competition. I just think that I think Tyler Buckner has just kind of made a gap between him mm-hmm. and Drew Pine going back from the spring until now. So I expect it relatively shortly. I don't have any information on that. You know, we're just kind of mm-hmm. speculating at this point, but I wouldn't expect it to drag on personally. Yeah. People in the chat today are trying to start problems, Ryan. My man, John Christoffic says, Brian loves the wishbone offense. John's trying oh, yeah. to start some stuff with me today. <laughs> he also <laughs> predicted that we would be matching today, and he nailed that as well. He so did. maybe maybe he's on to something. Maybe, maybe well, we he's should, on We should something. do – we should rank your top five least favorite offenses. Mm-hmm. Would, would – uh, <laughs> maybe we I mean, there's really, there's really only a couple. I don't like, don't like the triple option, and I don't like the wishbone. Those are it. I just – I'm not a big wish, uh, option Single fan. wing? You like single wing? <laughs> <laughs> whatever it's all good if you got the right personnel and you're in the right decade sure go for it i've never liked the 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 triple option the way that navy does it. I've, I've never liked that it's like it to me it's like i just i get why they do it totally they should do it it just it's like to me it's like it's not real football you know it's just like it's like all this gimmicky stuff but the it navy, works for them the navy triple in in uh, ncaa 14 was undefeated brian on the have never used that in a thing and i'm ashamed of you for actually wasting time <laughs> On a video game using the triple option. I, was, <laughs> I, I couldn't be beat, man. I could not okay. be beat. Okay. AST12321. Thank you for your super chat. Very, very much, AST. I saw a comment on the board. Ryan, I'm going to direct this one to you. I mm-hmm. saw a comment on the board that uh, and this was actually an accurate comment because Jim Knowles said this in a press conference uh, that, Ohio, that the new Ohio State defensive coordinator, Jim Knowles, said the defense was 25% installed. Is it just me, or does that sound like we might get a first-year Knowles D? Now, what he's referring to for context, Ryan, yeah. we have talked about on the show, Jim Knowles' defenses usually have struggled in the first year. And the reason for that is, is he's a very good defensive coordinator, but he sort of has walked into situations in the past where he was inheriting a messed-up situation. So it's like, you got nothing to lose, get it right first. And so he would kind of go heavy into, we're going to do it my way. And then the first year at Duke, his first year at Duke and his first year at Oklahoma State, they actually gave up more points, more yards, and more yards per play than they did the previous year when they were fired. And then eventually, as he got his players in and 
guys picked up his complex system, defenses ended up being pretty good. And so uh, that's, I think, where he's coming from. So, Ryan, when you look at that percentage and, you know, your what weekend at fall camp, it's 25 percent installed. How would you how would you answer that question? We talked about this before. I think that that's actually a good thing for Ohio State, mm-hmm. if I'm being honest. Like, I think that Jim Knowles, and again, it's a different situation where you're walking into more talent than you were with a Duke, for instance, right? But, and even Oklahoma State, but to that degree, I would say that keeping it simplistic year one with such good athletes, I think is the is the way to optimize the talent that you have. And I think that overcomplicating things early on is it's like it's like I, I like guys kind of getting eased into it because especially on a defensive side of the football, it's like it's one of those things where sometimes simpler is better, right? And and I think that it's better for the Ohio State defense, honestly, just in especially in the beginning of the season, if you are just working consistent understanding of things and not trying to cram in too many different personnel groupings or ideologies into the defense. And I think that that can overcomplicate some good athletes at, at times, especially early on. So I think it's actually a good sign for coach Knowles and the Ohio state defense that maybe he is not pushing to install things too quickly. It's kind of easing good athletes into things that they know th- things, things that they're comfortable with. So mm-hmm. I think that's pretty positive for the Ohio state team. If I'm being completely transparent. I think for me, Ryan, it would depend on how much more of it do they want to do. Because if he's like, look, first year, we want to have 50% of the playbook installed by the start of the season. That's fine. You know, I mean, that's not as much as you might think. I think for me, it, it if, if that would that would get it to where I think they'd be fine, but I do think they'd have some struggles early. But let's say he does what a lot of other coaches do, which is we're going to install a bunch early and then just spend the rest of the fall camp kind of building on that. So I don't know the answer to the second part of the question for me, Ryan, is, okay, 25% in. That's a lot of an entire playbook that you're starting new because you're adding a lot of new stuff because normally if it's like when Clark Lee's doing because you install every year. You know what I mean? You always install every single year because you have new players, you have little wrinkles that are different, and you don't just assume the guys remember everything from the year before. But when guys do remember stuff, it, it allows you to get through way quicker. Right. So what could happen is, is that you can just throw a lot at them early and then say, OK, you're going to sink a little bit, but then we're going to stop here of adding new and then just spend the rest of the time perfecting what we've added in. I don't know if that's his plan or if he plans on getting to 100 or 75 or 50. I don't know the answer to that. That would all ultimately dictate my thoughts on on that. I also think one big difference mm-hmm. is. If he does, if he does go, the further he gets into his playbook in fall camp, the worse it's going to be for them when they play Notre Dame, in my opinion, because they yeah. will make mistakes. But I think that it won't be like the first year as at those other places for two reasons. Number one, he has way better players at Ohio State than he had at those other places. Way better players. He also has a significantly better offense than he had at other those other places. And that's going to help the defense because when he does make a mistake, then the offense is going to counter right back with the score of their own. And that kind of allows them to maybe take some more risks, Ryan. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I think the combination of those two things is why you won't see the big drop off. You won't see Ohio state this year as a team, giving up more points, yards and yards per play on the season than they gave last year. In my opinion, I don't think that they will. Sure. Could it happen against Notre Dame? Sure. Not saying it will, but it could, but I think in the end, and honestly, if I'm Jim Knowles, I'm not, so much worried about the Notre Dame game. And the reason I say that is, is I'm worried about it from we need to go win. But what I mean is I'm not so afraid of what happens in that game that I don't do what I think is going to be best for us for the entire season. Because the reality is if Ohio State loses to Notre Dame, as long as it's a competitive game and they run the table and they're 12 and one at the end of the year and their only loss is to a Notre Dame team that we think is going to be pretty good. I think they're still in the playoffs, the college football playoff. So I, I don't think they should completely cha- build their entire team-building philosophy around winning that first game. It's very important, but it's not the end-all, be-all because they have bigger things in mind, Big Ten Championship, and then a Big Ten Championship leads to potential for another playoff appearance. And that, to me, is, is going to be the key. And then when you look at Ohio State's schedule, Ryan, 
know, I, I do think that you're talking about a situation where if they can get through the Notre Dame game with, you know, s- skate by with a win over against Notre Dame, or if they're in a situation where they lose that game, they got a couple weeks to get right. And, mm-hmm. you know, they got Arkansas State the next week and then Toledo the next week, and then they do play Wisconsin, but Wisconsin is a home game, and it's not necessarily an offense that you need to spend a ton of time coming up with a million different gimmicks for offensively. No, they've kind of handled Wisconsin relatively well. Then you got Rutgers. So the next month, you've got one team that's even in your in your same universe as you as a football team. What, Rutgers? So, uh, <laughs> uh, Arkansas <laughs> State, dude. Come on. Get with it. Sure. Um, clearly, it's Toledo. Uh, so that's kind of my thing is, is, and you're not going to face an offense that's got the firepower that Notre Dame is going to have until you know, much later in the season, in my opinion. I mean, if at all, in the regular season. So uh, that's that's kind of where I my stance on that. But but good question, AST, and and answer Ryan. Obviously, good answer. If if Jim Knowles is trying, still has a uh, if he has the thought process that he's going to put 100 percent in, and he's only at 25 right now though for, for the fall camp, then. I feel a lot better about Notre Dame's chances offensively. I'll just leave it at that. And I don't think he's going to do that. I don't. I don't think so either. Yeah, I, 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 don't. I think. I mean, I think good coaches learn from mistakes that they've made in the past, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think that he will. I think he has a general understanding. Like the first year in my last couple stops were not the best, and why did that happen, right? Like, they're like now. Let's, but I let's think it was purposeful, though, I, because and and the reason I say that is is because he walked into two situations where they were bad. There was no expectations of a championship at Duke that first year, at Oklahoma State that first year. So I think the, it, the circumstances call for that. Like, look, I was brought in here to fix something that was horrible. And, you know, we're going we got, we're gonna to take some hits first because we got to completely change this whole thing around. So if I'm right and that was purposeful and he would accepted that, then we also then would have to assume, Ryan, that he's smart enough to know that you can't do that at Ohio State because the expectations. It – so that's my thought. But if you're right and he it wasn't his plan, it, then I also think we have to assume that he is also smart enough to know that he can't do that again. So either way, whether I'm right or you're right about why he did that, yeah. we both agree he's smart enough to know that he can't do that again at Ohio State long term, like big picture for the whole season. So it's kind of like, hey, look, what are we going to do? Because can we be honest? Nobody installs 100% of their playbook. No one with a brain. <laughs> No. because every team's going to have different wrinkles. Hey, we like this play, but we don't have the personnel to do that this year. And that's just, that's the reality of it. And then you definitely don't do it when you go into each game. You may have it all put in during fall camp, but once you get into prep for your first game, then you scale it back and you start focusing on what you do best and what's going to help you beat that football team. Blaine Tiller asks, if you had to replace Freeman with either Jim Harbaugh, James Franklin, Scott Frost, Mel Tucker, or Ryan Day, who do you take? My immediate thought is Ryan Day, but I would think about Mel Tucker if I'm being honest, because he's he's also a dynamic recruiter. Yep. So that would be the two I would I would pick for, and I I, I actually have a little more. I understand why James James Franklin might be an interesting conversation, but for me, like I I think that there's more upside with Mel Tucker just as a game day coach Agreed. too in comparison. So I would say Tucker or Day. You can you can convince me on either one. Mm-hmm. The other three, no, thank you. So regarding Mel Tucker, I, I think I like what he's doing right now in the recruiting trail. I mean, he's getting after it. He's really getting after it. At least him and his staff. I don't know if it's him as much. I don't follow them enough to know like if it's him, but the staff is getting after it. And I would assume he plays a role in that. And as you said, I think he's a, he's already proven to be a better a better game day coach than James Franklin. Yes. Can he recruit like James Franklin? That's a bigger question mark for me. And that yeah. that that I don't know, but I don't. I wouldn't want to recruit the way I wouldn't. I wouldn't enjoy Notre Dame recruiting successfully the way that James Franklin recruits. It's a lot of gimmicks. It's a lot of fluff. It's a lot of BS, and I just don't care much for that. To be honest with you, it would be. It would. I, I would go with Ryan Day. The track record, the offense. I mean, it would kind of sell itself in a lot of ways. So I'd probably go there. But you know, if you're if you're gonna say, hey, it's gonna be Mel Tucker. I, Again, I need to see him still prove some things to me long term. But compared to those other three guys, I'll take take Mel Tucker in a heartbeat. Because here's one thing I know about the Notre Dame football team: if Mel Tucker's your football coach, they're going to be tough. Mm-hmm. So one thing I can definitely say that that's going to be the case is they're going to be tough and they're, and they're going to work and they're going to play with some edge. That Michigan State team played with an edge last year. They had some attitude, and mm-hmm. I liked their attitude. And I don't mean that like a negative way. I mean just like they had they played confidently. They were a good football team last year, in my opinion. Who would be who would be the guy that you would not even like 
you said the three that you would not you would not pick Frost, mm-hmm. Franklin, or Harbaugh. Who would be your last pick? Who's oh, last Scott pick Frost by a thousand miles. Even more than Harbaugh? I know oh, you yeah. Some distaste Jim for Harbaugh's yeah. weird. Yeah. Jim Harbaugh's a football coach. Scott Frost is from, from and I won't get into too much because, you know, I got to protect myself here, but let's just say there's some extracurricular activities that have been thrown around about Scott Frost that, to me, would be you're fired on the spot if you're the head football coach in Notre Dame. Don't disagree. And I don't worry about that with James. Like, I have issues with James Franklin, and I think he has done some shady stuff. You know, we know what happened at Vanderbilt, some things that have happened at Penn State. I don't have a lot of – I don't I don't feel like James Franklin would do that at Notre Dame. I think he's smart enough to know, like, you can't get away with that at Notre Dame. But that's but that right there is why he would be second to last on my list mm-hmm. is because there is that off-the-field stuff. Like, Jim Harbaugh's off-the-field stuff is what? Like, you know, he says weird things at a press conference, right? He like, his, he eats his boogers. Yeah, he <laughs> climbs a tree to, for a recruit. You know, I mean, it's like it's weird stuff, but it's not like that's going to get you put on probation. Right. Or you're going to have to fire your head coach. I've never I've never heard anything about Jim Harbaugh from that standpoint. I've never heard anything about Mel Tucker from that standpoint. Like those are things that for me are just like immediate red flags. You got to take a coach off. I've never heard anything like that about Ryan Day. So that's why those would be the only those are the only three I'd really consider. Uh, mm-hmm. Scott Frost is like, before you finish saying his name, like, no, you know, James Frank, before you finish saying his name, I say no. And I understand why the appeal would be, but I just don't want to win that way. And there's too much of the, the other, he ain't really paying attention to his program or he's promoting that in his program that I'm not okay with. And uh, that would make, would make me say, I don't know how the guy saw his job. That okay. that's my question. And, you know, so I've heard that Scott Frost has stopped doing that stuff, whether that's because he's grown up, which I doubt, or because he's trying to save his job, which is most likely. You know, I think that should help their team this year. But then if they start winning, does he go back to being an idiot? That's going to be the question mark. So it'll be very interesting. We had another super chat down here from uh, John Hassman. John, thank you very, very, very much for your super chat. Says, hey, fellas, long-time listener, medium-time board member, first-time chatter. Was watching the 2009 Nebraska versus Texas game last night. Couldn't help but see comparisons between Buckner and McCoy. Your thought. Thanks a lot. Ryan, I have heard this one a lot about yeah. the two. A lot. And I want to get your thoughts on, on Colt McCoy and Tyler Buckner as players. I mean, Buckner is a much more dynamic runner. I mean, like physically speaking as well, like he's going to break more tackles. Colt McCoy was a good like extender of the football in college. Mm-hmm. Like he could run when he needed to. And he had some decent rushing numbers from my, what I remember at Texas. Quick, accurate, body type is similar. I can get there with the body type. They're both about six foot one, two to 10, two fifteen type of guys. They, they're pretty thick guys for the most part. I would say... I get a lot of the mechanical stuff inside inside the pocket. Like I think that they both are pretty compact delivery, get the ball out quickly. I do think Buckner has a stronger arm though than Colt McCoy overall. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that if you told me, Brian, if, if the question was for Joe that Tyler Buckner is a more traitsy version of Colt McCoy, then sure, I can get I can get there, right? I think his arm's stronger, and I think he's a more dynamic athlete. But from a pocket perspective. I can get there with it. Body mm-hmm. type, pocket perspective. I think there's some similarities there. I can get there. I think that how they impact the game is a little different. I think that their skill set is different. What I think, however, is I do think that both are – were. I think Tyler is going to end up being very comparable to Colt in two areas. Number one, just kind of what you were saying, around just the overall, he's a playmaker. Colt didn't have a great arm. He was athletic, but not like a dynamic athlete like Tyler is. You know, he did, he wasn't that big. Like, there's nothing redeemable about like Colt McCoy to say when you first watch him, like, that guy's going to be a great player. But you know what he was? He's a playmaker, and he was he just battled, and he was smart. Yep. And I think Tyler has all those things. And 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 Colt was money. Now, we'll find out if Tyler can be that or not. We don't. I don't know the answers to that. But Colt just made plays, and, and Tyler is a more dynamic, like Ryan said, a more dynamic version of that. And, and I, and I think it took, I hope that the one thing they don't have in common is Colt was a gunslinger, right? I mean, he would, he, he turned the ball over a lot his first couple of years yes. and grew out of that. And I think part of that is because he didn't have the physical tools. He had to force stuff. I think Tyler doesn't have to do that. 
So I don't think he'll he'll be that. But I, I do think that there are – I understand the similarities between the two. I really mm-hmm. do. I just think that that Tyler's a little bit more dynamic. Colt is more proven as a big game guy. We got to see if Tyler can be that guy. But I understand why people think those comparisons are, are accurate. And I, and I like them from a guy can just make plays. And he does it in different ways. And, and the extender yeah. part is a great one, too. I think Tyler's going to do a lot of that. I think Tyler is going to add that extra dynamic, like you said. Like Colt had good rushing numbers in his career. Yeah, and it just but Tyler's that guy that you're worried like this guy's going to rip it off for forty at any point in time, and you really have to you really have to be prepared for that. Cole, Cole McCoy was like a Matt Corral kind of runner, yeah. right? Like he was like slippery, and mm-hmm. I mean I hate those cliche scouting terms, but Colt McCoy was a gamer, man. Like he got stuff done. What are you mm-hmm. going to say about it? Not incredibly yeah. talented, but like got the most out of his ability by a landslide. Right. And he and his those Texas teams he played on weren't as talented as the 05 team, top to bottom. But they won a lot because you know Colt was a winner. And the, the Big 12 was kind of you know kind of slowly going down a little bit for the most part during the later part of his career, but he was a really good football player. We had a uh, super sticker from Richard Powell. Richard, thank you very much for that. Appreciate that very much. Alex Flagstad. Uh, with a super chat. Thank you, Alex. Hey, y'all uh, hopped in late, so apologies if this is off topic, but always wondered. Our programs using virtual reality to train quarterbacks to read defenses seem like it would be super useful. So first of all, uh, on the Friday mailbag, there really isn't much you can do that's off topic. Obviously, we would want to stick to football, but we have a question about World War II tanks that I'm going to get to in here in a little bit. Uh, so uh, I don't know if Notre Dame is using that, Ryan. They have in the past. There are definitely a lot of teams, that, especially in the NFL, mm-hmm. that use virtual reality in some way, some form to, to train quarterbacks. Not exactly the same, but do you remember Jonathan Stewart when he was at Oregon, the running back? They used to have that like virtual reality mm-hmm. thing where it like increases peripheral vision. Mm-hmm. So like lights would flash on different sides and he had to react mm-hmm. a certain way. So I, I know that, that running running backs especially have used that to kind of improve their peripheral vision, just their vision in general. So I do know that that is used just in general for for skill position players. Quarterback play, I'm not as sure, to be honest. Like I, I mm-hmm. imagine that they have – some type of technology, but I definitely know that there is, there is absolutely a push to VR as, as a way to kind of improve just the, I think the, just the reactionary stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like I think that that's been a big push. Yeah. Got another super chat down here from Brendan Manning. Thank you, Brendan. He says, who's the most important recruit of the two thousands. I think Manti was not just for being a top recruit player, but also opening the Polynesian pipeline. That's I a think good that's one. fair. I, th- yeah. I think the only reason Brendan and I would kind of push back on that a little bit because I count the 2000s as the as 2000 to 2009, and you only had Manti for one of those years. And the Polynesian pipeline he opened up didn't really impact the 2009s. It didn't really start. You know, you had Myron Tungvaloa, Mosa, Kona Schwenke, Justin Utupo, Maris Luafau, Jordan Patelho, Aloy Gilman. You know, another another one of those kids. Uh, so it didn't really impact that decade. I mean, I, I still think, you know, it, but there's a, there's a lot of different ways you could go with this. I, I still kind of feel like, hmm, I got to think about this one because there's several questions I want to I want to go with it on. I mean, part of me is like Jimmy Clausen because that kind of started Notre Dame getting some a run on big time players, which then impacted the 2010s. At the end of the day, I, Brandon, boy, this is a good question because every time I'm about to answer the question, I go back and I think of somebody else that would have been an impactful player. I think at the end of the day, I have to go with Brady Quinn. I think it's where I got to go with it because when you look at Brady Quinn and the success he had, you know, like I still feel like even though Charlie Weiss's tenure didn't end really well and, and Notre Dame didn't have a lot of success under Charlie, under Charlie Weiss in his last three years. I mean, just, I mean, literally a losing record his last three years. The thing about it is, that Notre Dame still had some cachet a little bit in his re- end of his recruiting cycle, which then let Brian Kelly inherit a better team talent wise than a lot of people give credit for because of th- what Brady did. I mean, a lot of the, you know, the man time. I mean, if, if Brady Quinn doesn't, isn't Notre Dame starting quarterback in 2005, 2006, do they even have the prestige to even be able to sell Manti? Hey, we, we're going to get back to what they were under him. So I think at the end of the day, as I go back and I mean, think Julius Jones pops in my head, you know, all these Vic, Justin Tuck pops in my head. But you said most important. And I still think Brady Quinn is the most important. And look, let's talk about now. Brady Quinn is still impacting the University of Notre Dame today. 
I mean, he's a big driver behind one of the big collectives that's coming to Notre Dame. So not only did Brady Quinn have a big impact on Notre Dame for that two-year stretch and then opening up avenues to recruits moving forward because of what he was able to do leading the program, but that impact has gone over the last two decades. Brady has, ma has made an impact at with Notre Dame in different ways over the years, and he's a, no bigger than what he's doing now with this with this um, this collective that he's doing. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, I think I'd have to go with Brady Quinn for that reason. It's an interesting one. I, I think there's a couple ways that you can interpret this one. I actually am probably going to defer to Brand Brendan and say Monty Teo would probably be my answer as well. Just mm -hmm. it's like the one that just sticks with me for some reason. Like right. as a fan, like it's the one I remember most. And then he was obviously a instrumental player for them let me interrupt real quick ryan because brennan filled came out later and said ran out of the room ran out of room on the super chat but basically meant 2000 to present so gotcha. if he if you go from 2000 to present ryan then then what you're talking about manti yeah becomes even more relevant because like my only pushback would have been but manta only impacted you for that one year of that decade but if you open it up to 2000 to present ryan then it's hard to say anybody other than manti the only other right. one that I think is debatable at that point in time would be Brady Quinn at the, you know what I mean? When you talk about long-term aspect over that period of time. So in my, in my fandom, which started again in like the early two thousands, mostly like late nineties, not nineties, a little bit, the two guys that have ignited my fandom, I would say to the highest of levels were Brady Quinn and Monty Teo. And I would, I would, if you want to say either one, I'm completely good with that because as a Notre Dame fan who did not see the golden age of Notre Dame football, those are the two guys for me personally that I remember most and have the most vivid memories of greatness. Like mm -hmm. those guys kind of push the envelope. Like that's what you want a Notre Dame football player mm -hmm. to look like, like those two guys, in my opinion. So I, I am good with either one of those responses. Cause for me personally, those guys kind of stick with me the most yeah. in, during my fandom personally. I think runners up would be Quentin Nelson would be in there. The other one that I would want to throw in there is Jalen Smith. Jalen's good. And, and the reason – because Jalen was a five-star. You know, Landon Jalen Smith was big. And then, you know, he comes to Notre Dame and, and he he has the success he had. And I, and I think he's – you know, he's a guy that I think had an impact on the program as well. Those are guys that I would look at and say had probably the, the most important recruits. That's and fair. hopefully that answer changes here in the next couple of years and we've got to go with somebody else. <laughs> sure. That would, that would make it uh, – that would make it very, very entertaining. Next question we got up here from, uh, let's see here, from John A1. John says, what makes defensive line stunts effective? Are they more effective versus run or pass? Ryan, you're the defensive guy, so I'll let you answer this one. John, I mean – it, it, I mean, it could have effect in both areas, honestly. I think that I think the highlight plays you usually see are against the pass, just because it's the biggest thing for offensive linemen is such a unnatural and controlled position where like you're working through your process. And I think that defensive line stunts for me is you're trying to speed up their process and you're trying to confuse offensive linemen, right? Because there has to be a lot of communication with passing players off and then getting on, you know, you st continuing to stay on your track and do all that type of stuff. And for me, defensive line stunts are, oh man, this guy slanted this way. I got to react to him. But then here comes a guy off his butt that should be my guy now. And you're causing confusion between players. And offensive line is a position where you need to be, you need to be a collaborative effort. You need to be kind of, entwined in the guys that are next to you, but defensive line stunts are kind of trying to break that process, right? Like you're trying to create a lot of movement, create a lot of confusion. So it can affect both. I, I don't, I don't think that there's one that I would necessarily say it affects more. I think that you would see it against pass a little bit, where as far as like the impact, because like a sack is going to be a bigger impact most of the time, rather than like a one yard tackle for loss. Right. So I think it's just kind of what we, profile is like the bigger loss type of thing but it, it has its merits against each side it's it's literally just trying to confuse offensive linemen in their communication and i think as an offensive coach beyond that the confusion part is it can mess up your your eyes as an offensive player and it can mess up your body your leverage so one of the common mistakes guys use when handling lines twists and stunts is they turn their hips and so anytime you start turning your body and then you got to come back, it gets you off your base and it really allows you to just kind of get disruption. Like Ryan said, it, it's a confusion 
But what does confusion do? It creates disruption. It creates a reset of the line of scrimmage in the defense's favor. It creates it throws off the time. It can, if not picked up properly, can throw off the timing of the run game, get the quarterback out of out of sorts. The counter to that, Ryan, is if it doesn't hit, I may blow you up off the ball. And and it, I would say the stunts don't kill you in the pass game any more than not getting a pass rush does in a straight pass rush. If you don't hit a stunt or you don't time it right or it doesn't work against the run, I will gash you. That's that's the risk that you run. So they can be they can be effective birth versus both. They yeah. can create even bigger plays against the run, in my view, uh, but they can also give up bigger plays. So that's the risk yeah. reward and why teams can't do it all the time, in my opinion. Like you, you, you overdo it because you may catch me on some TFLs, but I'm gonna catch you three or four times on these. We're just gonna blow you up and just and house it. So is it really worth it for that couple three yard losses? You know, you need to weigh that. You know, weigh that if you're gonna bring that all day. And, and I'm thinking about like a de- an offensive line working against like a, a tackle end stunt. So usually, you know, the, the defensive tackle is slanting outside. It is great for offensive tackles when they can see it and react to it because then you just are riding some bigger guy outside and you know that he can't threaten the outside track on you. And you're just like, yep, that's an easy wood for me. I love this type of thing. So yep. to your point, Brian, if you do not do it well or you are a little bit too – if, if you're a little bit too predictable with how you set up these te- these different types of stunts, then you could be in some trouble. There's no yep. doubt about it. Yep. Got some interesting questions down here, Ryan. You know, more comments and, and conversation about the comps, right, mm-hmm. uh, for Tyler Buckner. And I think it's a fascinating conversation. And I think the fact that people keep talking about it is because he's a hard player to comp. I there just a aren't one. a ton of guys like him. Uh, that that you kind of think are fair. Like the only ones I can think of that I think fit really the best from a skill set standpoint are kind of unfair to put up. And like and like here's one down here that I wanted to pull up that somebody just brought up. Uh, let me let me here we go. A uh, super chat from Ryan Olenek. Thank you for that, Ryan. He says, "Hey guys, sorry for another comp, but what about Buckner versus a uh, Kyler Murray? Also, let's go. College football is coming. I'm excited about that. But just from a dual threat ability where he can be a pocket passer on one snap and then a dynamic designed runner on the next and then a scrambler on the next i mean just overall skill set kyler is probably the closest there's there's two things that make me want to not say that number one is it's really unfair to compare him to a guy that threw for four thousand yards and rushed for a thousand yards the same year one to heisman and two kyler had a much stronger arm kyler murray has a cannon for an arm Tyler okay. doesn't Tyler has a good arm, but it's not a cannon. But right. overall impact on the game, I don't know if there's a better comparison. If you take away the tit for tat, okay, he's gonna so you're saying he's gonna throw for four thousand, rush for a thousand. No, I'm just about the way he can impact the game in so many different ways. I mean, in recent in the last 10 years, is there a better comp than Kyler Murray? I, I have a hard time finding one, just skill set wise and how he can impact yeah. the game. You, you know who I kind of see a little bit as far as just a runner and body type? And this is this is not a great comp because of the passing side of things. But he does remind me a little bit of Jalen Hurts from a body type and run style perspective. Yeah. You don't – like, I, I thought Jalen – Well, like, just I think because Jaylen's you just – physicality and – But see, to me, though, you just answered why I don't like that comp. Because you mm-hmm. had to split it in half and only go with part sure. of it. Sure. And, and that's the reality of it. So that's why I say, like, if you're going to try to compare him to someone who – his running style is exactly like this person's, and his throwing is – there isn't that one person. Yeah, the reason I, I think Kyler makes more sense is I'm not comparing him how specifically you would call plays and how mm-hmm. Kyler ran on this particular concept. He was shifty. He was shaky. He had speed. I'm not comparing him to Ky- – they're different throwers. They have different arm strengths. What I'm, what I'm saying is, and I think this is why the Kyler comp works best for me, is how he impacts the game from an all around nature is why I think the comp works. He can scramble. He can make plays with his arm because of his legs. He can make plays with design runs and he can, he can sit in the pocket all day long. Here's the thing. When Tyler Buckner gets to his full potential, Mm -hmm. you can't stop him. You can only hope that he stops himself. And I, and I generally mean that. And and that's not like a, a hype of like, you know, the greatest thing ever. The point is, What I mean is you can't stop them is there's nothing schematically you can do to take away this one thing and beat them. The only hope you can have is to confuse them and get them into mistakes. And the point I'm making is 
if you want to play against the pass to take away his ability to throw, he can mm-hmm. run for 140 yards on you. But if you're going to come up and say, hey, we're going to not make him throw to run the ball and we're going to keep him in the pocket all game, he can beat you. And that's why, like, the Jalen Hurts thing doesn't fit for me. Because if you could take away Jalen Hurts' ability to run in college, he wasn't a, an incredibly effective quarterback. Like Kyler would. Kyler could not run once and destroy you. Mm-hmm. You know, and he could run it 25 times and destroy you. And that's kind of where I think Tyler will get to. But it's just there's not a direct comparison of he runs like this guy, he throws like that guy, and they mm-hmm. it's the same guy. I just it, It's hard for me to find that comp. It's and, really hard. I, I'm yeah. about to say this, though, Brian. We know we love Archer on this show, but I'm about to block him after this comment oh, he no. just made. Oh, no. Where he said, I'm hoping Sean Clifford is the closest comp. Archer. I'm about to put you in timeout for five minutes. I, I will not accept this conversation. Mm-mm. That's just mean and nasty. Mean. But I love where he's mean. coming from because he's kind of like, uh, I hope that he's not like the guys. That's an Ohio State fan. Hope it's he's fair. not like the guys you just talked about or otherwise Ohio State's going to be in trouble. Here's a comp I've seen brought up for Tyler Buckner that I don't like, and it's not the first time I've seen it, and that's why I'm bringing it up again. Uh, yeah. Milton Fan, 15, thank you for the comment, but he said from a play comparison perspective, I think Baylor Mayfield, Baker Mayfield is a good comp to Tyler Buckner. I don't because I don't think Baker Mayfield could – ever impact the game anywhere close to the way that Tyler Buckner could as a runner. Agreed. And that's why I don't like that comp to be completely There's no, there's, there's just nothing about his game that re- reminds me of him. I mean, like if, if you're, again, if you're going for like the size body thing, type somewhat, a, a little yeah. bit of a body type thing, but Baker Mayfield had a little improvisation bu- uh, skills at Oklahoma, but he wasn't a great athlete. He was just a tough, tough quarterback Sh- arm strength. I mean, the arm, the, the release is not the, nearly the same. The, the just the ability as a passer is not. The, it's just, yeah, I, I don't love that comp overall. You, you, yeah, I, I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. He, he's a young guy. I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, here's I've seen this kind of cool. It reminds me of Tebow. I think that isn't a bad comparison. If you take out the direct style of play again, yeah, this is the problem. We're going to be here all day trying to find a comp that works. If you're trying to find someone who has the same exact body type, style, throwing motion and all that. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, the Tebow one works because I think the, I think Tyler, if you're going to get into specifics, I think Tyler's ability to run the ball is more similar to Tebow's than it is Kyler Murray's. But yeah. in, but then again, part of the, but you're not going to be able to go to that full degree, Ryan, because Tebow was basically a fullback once he got the ball in his hands. It, Tyler will be able to run you over in space, but you're not going to run Tyler Buckner the way you did Tim Tebow, like so. If you talk about big picture impact the game, okay, sure. Run, throw, maybe an unorthodox throw in motion, that kind of thing. Sure. But then yeah. you start getting into the narrow specifics, and an offense with Tim Tebow is going to look a lot different than an offense with Tyler. They Buck. used to have – they used to put just guys like Jeff Demps and yeah. Chris Rainey at running back because on third and one, Tim Tebow's running quarterback power. <laughs> like that's, right. that's how the game works in that, right. that system, you know? Right. So – and I don't know if I want to do that all the time with Tyler Bunker. He's not nearly as big. Your I mean, spots yeah. with it, but yeah, I agree. right, I agree. He's, I mean, he's not two fifty like Tim Tebow was. There's a, there's a pretty big difference there. Tebow is a big boy, man. He's a big yep. boy. Yep. John A. One asks: In modern football, how good do linebackers need to be in man coverage? What are the base coverage expectations for a D one top twenty five linebacker play? It, it's so John, I mean, it really depends if you, if you have a linebacker that is good in man coverage, then that is a big bonus, man. Cause that means that you can do a lot more things on the second level. Mostly though, I would say what I need from a linebacker is to be able to be a good zone dropper and have good eyes to cover, to, to close passing windows in zone coverage. I don't necessarily need a guy that's going to be a great coverage, uh, man, the man coverage guy, but it's, it's very valuable. And there are going to be sometimes, like I think of like, you know, when we're talking about like, you know, the outside, outside routes running just like a little, you know, a little slant or something. And the running back is leaking on a wheel out of the backfield. Like there are going to be times where you're going to be forced into man coverage. But for the majority, I just need a guy that's good in zone, a guy that has good eyes, a guy that knows how to get to a landmark. I can work with that. Right. So that even goes for the NFL, to be honest. I know people make a big deal because it's a, it's a space driven leak now, but I, I still don't need my linebackers to be great man to man coverage guys. I need them to be smart. I need them to be disciplined. I need them to be good zone droppers. That's what I need mostly. Yep. Next question is Blaine Tiller. Which current head coach besides Freeman do you think will win, will win, will, will be next to win their first championship? 
That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I mean, it's hard for me not to say Ryan Day. I think that's the easy answer because his program's closest to it. And it's got a good spot, yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. you know, but, you know, I think it'll be someone that surprises us. Like, who would have guessed Ed Orgeron going into the 2019 season, right? Like, if you'd have asked me this question on August 12th before 2019, I would have would, probably wouldn't have guessed Ed Orgeron. And I'm someone who had LSU going to the playoff that year. I mean, I – I just think they were going to win it. You know, I thought Clemson had beat them or Bama would beat them or, you know, somebody beat them. Georgia, maybe, you know, and, you know, if you got two SEC teams in. So I wouldn't have got Ohio State was supposed to be really good in 2019. It was Ryan Day's first year. Justin Fields has taken over. They were going to be really good. I wouldn't have yeah. predicted they were going to be that good. And again, I had them in the playoff that year. So, you know, Ryan, as, as I look at, I mean, it's hard. I, I don't think there's a lot of teams that have shots to really be title contenders that would have other than Notre Dame and Ohio state, as far as, you know, someone who hasn't won it before. I, I don't, you know, I think when you look at the, the, the teams that people consider the title contenders this year, it's mostly coaches who've won it already. You know, it's right. Georgia, it's Alabama, it's, it's Clemson, it's, it's, it's teams like that. And, you know, and then the next two on the ranking. So like, if you look at the preseason top five, it's Alabama one, Ohio state two, Georgia three, Clemson four, Notre Dame five. That's the coaches poll top five. Well, Marcus Freeman and Ryan Day are the two guys without a title. And you got Jim Harbaugh. Jimbo Fisher has won a title. So you can't count him at Texas A&M. Because a lot of people say, well, a and an up-and-coming team. They could win a title. Well, Jimbo's already won a title. They've been up and coming for yeah. six years. Utah's not going to win a national championship. Brent no. Venables is not going to win a national championship. I'm just going down the top ten. It's not going to be Dave Aranda. It's not going to be Mike Gundy. It's Tec- not going to be Dan Lanning. Yeah, you know, it's not going to be te- Dave Dorn. Technically, Brett Venables has already won a championship as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I know, want, I'll want i go like as a head coach. I mean, I think it's fair to say that because then you could kind of get into, you know, situations where, uh, you know, you could you could eliminate Ohio State off the list. They've had assistant coaches that have won national championships at places. You know, what I mean, so I'm I'm not going to go there. But then you kind of keep going down the list. Is it going to be Dave Dorn at NC State, Mel Tucker at Michigan State, Lincoln Riley at USC, uh, mm-hmm. Pat Narduzzi at Pitt? You know Miami and and Mario Cristobal. That's an interesting you know, one. Cristobal's an but, interesting. But one. a title? No, they're not going to win a not, title not this year. But into right, the future, right, maybe. right. Yeah, they're a right. couple years away. Uh, sure. Is it going to be Texas? I think that's probably would be the one that I would go with next. They're in and, the. I think Miami and Texas are in the same bucket. Like yeah. it's not going to happen this year, obviously. I, but a couple years in the future, maybe. I'm awesome. going to put Texas ahead of Miami for two reasons. Number one is I think that they are they're a better foundation, and and. Uh, yeah, I think, but I think with Texas, like, so in the next couple years, I'm going with Texas because Texas is going to be the Big 12 now for two more years, right? Or is this the last year for them in the Big 12? They're they're going in 2024. So they have okay, two so they years. got two more yeah. years. Yeah, their 2023 team is going to be dangerous. Yeah, and they're going to be in the Big 12. You know, either they're either Quinn Ewers is the guy people think he is, or at least close to it, or Arch takes over, right? One of the two. But the rest of the town around them is going to be loaded. They have that Malik Murphy yes. kid that's pretty yes. good too, right? That's, yeah. yeah, he's a bit raw, but he's very talented. Yeah, Quarterback won't be a problem is kind of the moral of the story, right? Sure. And they're going to be loaded at receiver. They had a top five recruiting class, class last year. They're going to have a top five recruiting class this year. You know, they're going to lose Bijan Robinson and say, okay, fine, we'll replace him with Cedric Baxter, who they just got the other day. You know, J- Xavier Worthy is going to be a junior. I think their defense and, and Coach Kwiatkowski's third year is going to be improving good enough. I think their yeah. offensive line in year three of Kyle Flood is going to be much better. And the young talent that you're worried about this year, Ryan, is going mm-hmm. to be better next year, right? Sure. So I would put Texas as probably the next team on that list behind Ryan Day and Marcus Freeman or in that same conversation of as, as Ryan Day and Marcus Freeman, even more so than Miami. And the reason I say that is Mario Cristobal has a lot, lot longer to go to get Miami to that point. Number one, yeah. talent wise, and number two, uh, it's just Miami still has some issues that they got to work through as an institution to d- to know whether or not they'll even allow the football coach to take it that far, right? You know, and that's the other thing. Now, the the counter argument is is if Texas doesn't do it next year, it could get a lot harder for them to do it because that's when they go to the SEC. Now, mm-hmm. the caveat is I don't know how the scheduling is going to go. They're they're talking about having those weird pods, and I don't I don't know what their schedule is going to look like which could hurt their chances. But the way that he's recruiting right now in Texas, Ryan, they're not going to be, they're not going to back down from anybody in a couple of years. If he can get no. their mindsets right. And that's the only question. Texas has been a really mentally soft football team since, since uh, Colt McCoy left. 
Agreed. And I don't care who the head coach is. And it was the same way last year, which is why they kept losing all those games. I mean, they had they weren't that far away from being a ten and two team. If you just look at if they just won every game they led in the fourth quarter, they're what at worst nine and three. They always have talent. You man. know, they always have talent. It's yeah, it's up here and right here, and that's where I think Sark's Sark's going to get things turned around. USMA says, is there a strategic advantage for not naming a starting quarterback? My thought, keep them guessing as long as possible. Ryan, I've given my opinion on this a lot. How about you share yours? What are your thoughts on, because looking at it from someone who's who's coached defense in the past, who's a defensive yeah. guy, mm-hmm. looking at Notre Dame specifically, we have said in the past there are, there are situations where not naming a quarterback can help you. Right. For Notre Dame specifically, do you see it as an advantage? Not in this situation as much. I mean, we talked about it at the beginning of the show a little bit. Like it's if if this was a legitimate battle where you're like, we have two great players and we need to figure out which one we need to roll with, right? That's a situation where if I'm a defensive coach, I'm like, oh man, we have to repair for two two players that could equally have the opportunity to play that have maybe two different styles of play, right? Like that's where the trouble comes in. But in this one, in my opinion, We know who's going to be the quarterback. And like Brian said before, Ohio State's preparing like they're going to be facing Tyler Buckner because there's nothing that Drew Pine is going to bring to you that Tyler Buckner also can't do. So I don't think holding out on this one is going to be too much of a bonus for Notre Dame, if I'm being completely honest. I think this is much more – you have one player who has much more dynamic ability. You're preparing for him. You think it's kind of a preconceived notion who's going to be the starter. If it was a close competition and you had two different styles, like closely, then I would be like, okay, let's hold this off and let's ride this out a little bit more. But for this situation, I don't think waiting at waiting is going to be offer a, a ton of upside from a game plan perspective of trying to fool an opposition. Christopher Crosby says, Ryan, there was a lot of good pass rushers drafted last year. This is kind of a, a – NFL draft slash rookie deal. Yep. Ryan, there's a lot of good draft, a good pass rushers drafted la- this past year. Who do you mm-hmm. think will have the most sacks? And will it be over under Chase Young seven and a half from his rookie year? It's a good one. That is a good one. I let me tackle the over under in a second. I think that the guy is set up to have the best production year one. So Kayvon Thibodeau was my top ranked edge guy in this past draft. He was the guy I liked the most. And I think he's in a decent situation with the Giants because he's on the other side of his Ejo Jolari and they got Leonard Williams. And I think that's going to be a decent pass rush for the New York Giants. I would actually go with Jermaine Johnson because I just think he's the most NFL ready guy to be productive. I will say it's under, I say he have about seven, maybe seven and a half. Maybe it's a push Christopher for me. I just think that he's the guy that's going to hit the ground running and be closest to his ceiling. But I, I think that long-term Kayvon Thibodeau and maybe a Trayvon Walker, like those guys have more upside than a Jermaine Johnson. I just am a big, I'm a big believer that Jermaine Johnson is going to be a good football player from day one. I don't mm-hmm. think the upside is as high, which is why he fell into the twenties in my opinion. But I do think that he's going to have some pretty good first year production for the New York jets. Yep. Next question. Christopher Crosby says, Brian Auburn should be an SEC powerhouse. That that there was more nonsense with one of their QBs last week. Was it TJ Finley got arrested, I believe, last week? Uh, what is going on down there? It's shameful. Uh, I won't address the first part of that. I don't think Auburn is should be an SEC powerhouse. I think they should be a really good SEC team, but not a powerhouse. Auburn's never been a consistent powerhouse. No. They've had two runs in their tenure where they had elite players. I mean, yet you won a title in, in the eighties with Bo Jackson, correct? I believe they won a title with Bo. And then you had the run in 2010 with Cam Newton and the team that went, you know, that, that played Florida state with Nick Marshall. That wasn't a great team. That was a, a really good team, but I mean, they got, they played about as well as they could play and Florida state didn't play well and they still lost, you know? So I, mean, I think, I think Auburn should be a good football team consistently. There's no, and especially now, I mean, when we're going to the top 100, Ryan, Alabama's got a ton of players coming out of that state, man. Like, so much so that, like, Penn State's pulling kids out of that state. Oregon was pulling a couple kids out of that state last year before the coaching change because they weren't getting offered by by Alabama. So, yeah, it should definitely be better. But the reason it's not is, number one, uh, I think they made a bad hire in Brian Harson, and, and not that he's a bad coach. He's an okay coach. It's a horrible fit. Yes. I mean, it's a horrible fit. And then number two, you had this attempted coup by the boosters this offseason, which makes your program just look like a joke. 
Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, you get rid of Gus Malzahn because he's not winning you a championship when in reality, I don't think Gus Malzahn's a great coach, but you're a pretty decent team every year with him as head coach. And not only did did you fire him, but you just it was a slow death. Like you bled the program to death instead of just like getting it done. And like it was what, two, three years you kept hearing these rumors about Gus Malzahn's on the hot seat. Like that's going to kill you on the recruiting trail. It, it, it does so many different things. If you're going to if you want to fire coaches, fire him. You know what I mean? Like, don't do this thing where you sabotage him for three years because then the person that replaces him is taking over just a dumpster fire. And and that's what happened to Brian Harson, combined with the fact that he's a bad fit and not a great coach, just a mediocre coach, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And so those are the reasons why I think all I think I think we can blame Brian Harson and we can blame the head coach. We can blame Alan Green, the D, at AD, who's a got Notre Dame ties or maybe not taking more control of the program. At the end of the day, I put it on the money people. I put it on the boosters. You're the ones that have been doing this all these years. You know, you're a program that has said, if you win a title and have a bad year, like two years later, you're gone. You know, you could take a team to the national championship, but if in the next two years, this is what happened in 2013, you're not back there, all of a sudden we're going to put you on the hot seat and just basically sabotage you for the next – who wants that freaking job? So I can go be the second best school in that state? Hard pass. You know, there's a very unrealistic expectation of who they are as a program amongst the Auburn money people, and they have no problem destroying someone. And it, I just think it's a it's a place where, like, who wants that job? I think part of the reason Brian Harsha got the job is because they couldn't get anybody better. And they're definitely not going to get anybody better after this, in my opinion. It's that is a I mean, you said dumpster fire. That's exactly yeah. what it is. I mean, I was looking through the roster the other day, Brian. I'm just like, OK, you have Tank Bigsby, who's a dude, I think. Right. At times, the running back. He's a good football player. Except when he Owen, decides he's going to keep running out of bounds in the well, end of the Alabama game. His uh, decision making might not be the best, but he's a talented kid. Owen Popo, the linebacker, I think is a good football player. Colby Wooden's a decent football player at defensive line. They have the corner, Nehemiah Pritchett, who's a decent football player. Outside of that, man, that roster's barren, man. It yeah, is not, not a great good. situation. They they haven't been able to figure out the quarterback situation over the last few years either. I mean, Bo Nix was a talented guy, but he never was able to get to that level. Your starting quarterback coming back, TJ Finley, most likely is now facing some legality issues. Like, it's mm-hmm. just not a great situation at Auburn yeah. right now. Not no, it's, it's really bad. It's really bad. We have some more super chats down here. I did want to get to. We we really appreciate those very very much. Uh, we have one from William Chesney. Thank you, William, very much. Is hey fellas, we talked about guys on Notre Dame offense and defense who need to step up for Ohio State. Also talked about Ohio State offense and in, in the concerns we have. Who are the D guys who wor- who worry you or we have to contain regarding the Ohio State? Yeah, I, I think for me it starts up front. I mean that's really the only concern that I have with Ohio State is honestly for me is is this the game that the light goes on for Zach Harrison? Is this the game that it goes on for Jack Sawyer, JT, and then Tyleek Williams inside? I think it's Tyleek Williams one. is the big yeah. one for me. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that that kid. You saw spurts of Tyleek last year as a freshman mm-hmm. where you're like, oh, okay, this guy's got a little juice for an interior pass rusher, and he's a big kid as well. So he's the guy that I think could wreck you a little bit. Jack Sawyer, I think, has an opportunity to be pretty good. I'm just, I'm not buying into the Zach Harrison thing, and we'll see about JT. I know JT's really talented too, but mm-hmm. Ty Lake Williams is the number one guy for me. And then this is going to sound silly, Brian, but like the the only other guy in the front seven that worries me, not worries me, but a guy I think you need to keep attention to is Steel Chambers with a full off season of playing sure. linebacker. Like I think that that's one because he's a really dynamic athlete mm-hmm. on the second level. So yeah. that's a guy for me. That's a guy. Yep. Secondary, I, I want to make sure I know where Ronnie Hickman is at all times, but otherwise mm-hmm. not really sure. concerned. Per sure, se. right. Anthony Solomon asks, and, and the answer is going to be yes here, Anthony. Thank you for the super chat. But would it be a fireable offense if one of the IB staff pranked you by replacing your do with Mellow Yellow? Thanks for all of the great content. Yes. Yes, it would. Immediate <laughs> fireable offense. I'm actually going to have to rewrite Ryan and Ryan's contract and, and uh, Vince's contract and all the other contracts they have and, and make sure that that's in there. That needs to be a clause, Ryan. That has to be a, a, a mellow yellow clause in the contract. You know, when, so. I, when I show up for the Marshall game, I'm going to bring you mm-hmm. a 12-pack of Diet Dew and yep. we'll see how yep. that works. That might also be a fireable offense. <laughs> so uh, as we get closer to the Marshall game, some of y'all may want to get your resumes ready because uh, I may be on the, on the lookout for another recruiting guy. <laughs> 
be so gross. <laughs> what is this nonsense? Have you ever accidentally drank a diet drink when then you didn't know you were going to get it? Like, it's not in a can. But like, I, I hate that. When I order a normal Coke or something at the like a restaurant and they bring me a diet, it's the worst. Absolutely the worst. Can, can you instantly tell the, tell the difference yes. too? Like so about, here's the funny yeah. thing. So there's yeah. this restaurant down the street from my house called uh, mm-hmm. Before Brady's. It's like kind of a national, not nationalist chain. But anyway, for whatever reason, the way the car, the way they have the carbonization hooked up, there's the the drink fa- the drink thing in the back, right? Mm-hmm. With the normal one you pour under that the waitresses use for the restaurant, and then there's the one at the bar that they, you mm-hmm. know, the, the the host thing. They taste different, and so I always ask, can I have a coke from the bar? Because I don't like the taste of the one from behind. I told you I'm a connoisseur of this stuff. So one time my wife and in there, she's like, you can actually taste the Like the waitress didn't believe me. She says, okay, I'm going to try something. So she went back and got a Coke from the thing and then uh, from the back and then a Coke from the bar. She made me do a taste test and I nailed it right. I was like, it's that's the, from the bar. That's from the back. So, I mean, there's all types of things that will taste different, but yes, I definitely can tell when I get a diet Coke. Like, no, I'm sure that's regular Coke. Like, listen, lady, I've drank 74 million pops in my life. Okay. Uh, that's not a regular, that's definitely a diet. <laughs> So uh, just your ordinary, I'm much nicer than that usually. Just your ordinary Joe. This is a good one, Ryan. Game with the most masterful or most dramatic halftime adjustment that you can recall. Wow. I've um, got to go. I've got to go. The the one that strikes me, and I'm trying to remember what year it was. Um, I think it was 2016. Mm-hmm. Give me one. And it's going to be funny because he's a coach. Otherwise, I think it's kind of a not a good coach. But Penn State and Wisconsin in 2016 in the Big Ten title game. Wisconsin was up 28-14 at halftime. And, and Penn State scored late. But Penn State came out that next half. And they, like the first play from scrimmage, they went 70 yards for a touchdown. And just, they just, they just had wisconsin's number in that second half i mean they just flat had wisconsin's number in that second half and i actually think some of the adjustments happened before halftime but at halftime they really i mean joe moorhead in that in that game i thought did a masterful job of going into halftime figuring out what they did and then they came out in the second half and they steamrolled wisconsin i mean they outscored them 24 to 3 in the second half in the big 10 title game that is a that was a big one for me where it's like wow like I've never seen a team look so different in one half compared to the other on both sides of the ball in a big game than, than the 2016 big time title game. That that's the one that always stands out for me when anybody asks that. And it was more Joe, Joe Moorhead than it was James Franklin, in my opinion. I, I have to sit on this one. I might put this on the board later tonight to have like a little bit of talk about this topic. Cause I can't think of one that like just really pops mm-hmm. out to me as like, substantial like i saw someone put like the falcons pat super bowl second half i saw someone put like was that spring- adjustments or just choking like uh, it you know it, well yes yes i think the answer is is maybe a little of both but to your point there was definitely i have no idea i still have no idea what kyle shanahan was doing in that second mm-hmm. half like i still have no no idea as the falcons offensive coordinator but might have to might have to sit on that one for a little bit yeah it's a good one it's a good one, but I, I really think the Big Ten title game in 2016 is one for me. And look, props to Oklahoma State. I thought the adjustments they made defensively at halftime last year against Notre Dame were pretty good. Sure. Uh, it helped that Notre Dame just had no answers personnel wise, but they still had to make the adjustments. And they, an offense that absolutely shredded them in the first half, they did a pretty good job of shutting down in the second half. So I uh, have to give them have to give them credit for that one as well. No question about it. Okay, here's one time we get this a lot, Ryan. So I want to ask this. Mm-hmm. Let you answer it. In yesterday's O-line video, I was impressed with Emil Wagner's length and quick feet. If he can't make the weight, what other positions can, could he contribute? It's Tom, it's such a tough one because I'll say this. Emil Wagner has a very interesting combination of length and power and quick feet. Like there's – he's I, – I, I look forward to seeing how he's developed – I know that the easy one that a lot of people are going to say is defensive end because his body literally looks like a defensive end. But, I mean, early on, I I, I think I said this yesterday, that or we didn't have a show yesterday, two days ago, where, like, I would use him as a blocking tight end early on. You know, like, I wouldn't be, be against using him in that mm-hmm. department. Where does he have the best opportunity to excel? I guess defensive line. But, like, again, I would have to see him play defense. I never have seen that, right? Like, it's such a mm-hmm. tough conversation to me, but – 
I mean, man, the, the tools are fantastic. I really hope he can add, maintain, and that weight does not d- diminish any of his athletic gifts. Because if he mm-hmm. is able to hold any type of weight, man, he has the opportunity to be special. But yep. it's a it's a question mark until it's not. Yep. Yep. Notre Dame 2164. What's the first game that Tyler Buckner is going to have to put the team on his back and go win it? Uh Ohio State. I was gonna <laughs> like, say, yeah, 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 yeah. My man. Yeah. This might be the easiest answer that I have ever had to answer in this whole thing. I think it's going to be Ohio State. I think that's I think that's really the only game of the regular season that I can look at and determine now he's going to have to do that. Now, the flip side is that sometimes the game that it ends up being isn't a game that you would look at on the schedule and think that's going to be the game he's going to have to go ball out because that's what we've talked about all offseason. This year, last year, the great teams play complementary football. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that is, is you may be great on one side of the ball, but you're going to have an off game. Perfect example. We talk about defenses that have off games. Well, sometimes it's great offenses that have off games. And the, the example that I have, Ryan, is you remember in, in 2019 how good that LSU football team was? Yes. I mean, that offense was just, I mean, I mean, the only other offense of my lifetime that was as dynamic of, as that is, is probably, I'd say probably, uh, the 2000 was a 2008 Oklahoma team with Sam Bradford and so Chris that, Brown yeah. and DeMarco Murray with that 2000 yard rushers uh, on that football team. Like that was a great, great offense that couldn't get it done at the end of the season, but you know, pretty great offense. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the LSU offense is probably the best offense that I've, I've, I've ever seen in my lifetime. And they went out against Auburn and just struggled. I mean, turned the ball over twice. I mean, that 508 yards, but they just couldn't put in the ball in the end zone. They kept having to settle for field goals. Well, guess what? Their defense stepped up big that day. They only beat Auburn 23 to 20 that year. Mm-hmm. And a big reason for that was is the defense. I mean, the defense set them up with a touchdown in the second half uh, that that uh, that got them the ball. They were down 13-10 in the third quarter. I mean, think about that. 13-10 in the third quarter, they took the lead and never gave it back on a, on a, a series that went 45 yards, 45-yard touchdown drive. And so, you know, those are the things where, Ryan, you have to be able to play complimentary football. You absolutely have to play complimentary football. And it, I'm sorry, it was it was a punt. Like, the, it was a punt, but they buried him deep. It wasn't a turnover just in case people are unclear. Mm-hmm. But you have to play complimentary football. So, it, you know, on paper, it's Ohio State. It, maybe it doesn't turn out that way, and it turns out being like Stanford or something like that, you know, where – where the defense isn't having that game and he's got to just say, Hey man, I got this kind of thing. But when you just look at the schedule on paper, right, it's the first game of the year. It's Ohio state. He's going to have to be a guy against the Buckeyes. If they're going to go to Columbus at night in the opener and win that game, I think Tyler's going to have to have a big game. Oh, I agree. I mean, if Notre Dame has, if Notre Dame has an opportunity to win that football game, I think it's because Tyler Buckner had a chance to win the football game, right? Like that's, I think that that's the thing for me is that game is not going to be won by I, I I would be very surprised if Notre Dame was just like a ground and pound team that's able to dictate the full pace of that game and beat Ohio State in the shoot. Like they're going to have to mm-hmm. trade some offensive firepower, I think, to win that football game. And I think that that comes the explosive plays, I think, will be created by the dynamic ability of a Tyler Buckner as a runner and as a passer. So I agree mm-hmm. with you. I think we'll get a quick indication. And it's not the end all be all because he's only going to be a sophomore, right? So like it's. If he does, if he is in the position to win the football game and it doesn't go our way against Ohio State, it doesn't mean that Notre, that Tyler Buckner will never be a game big game player. It's just he'll be in the position, though, I believe, to win that football game if he plays to that degree. So, yeah, I think that Ohio State's the big the big moment for him, in my opinion, for sure. I think we had a, another comment that was similar to that from Sam Tyrell. He said, Brian, after Notre Dame beats Ohio State, who is the player of the game? And I and I think that ties in perfectly. With, so I think it's going to have to be – it's going to either be one of two people. It's either going to be Buckner or somebody on defense that makes just a couple huge game-changing plays. Yeah. You know, something something like that. You know, like a Jack Kaiser-type play against Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, where it's a close game and he just – And pick six. Breaks yeah. it. You know, it'd yeah. be something like that. And then he'd have to have a good game otherwise. But it'll be Buckner or somebody that does something like that. Or, I mean, the only, I mean, it could be a Foskey, Adam Yola, Maris Lufau, just for having a big game. Yeah. But I think it's going to have to be someone who just makes some kind of game-changing play on defense. Other than that, I think it's going to be 
it's going to be Buckner. And, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I could see view. it being like a, I could see it being like a Brandon Joseph, like yeah. two interceptions, one yeah. turn for a touchdown, some crazy thing like that. But I agree. I think the most likely is Tyler Buckner with a huge game. I'm going to say this. Okay. If Notre Dame beats Ohio State, barring it being something crazy like multiple scores set up by the defensive special teams, if an offensive player other than Tyler Buckner wins the offensive MVP against Ohio State, this team is going to be really, really, really good. That's fair. Meaning if they can beat Ohio State without Tyler Buckner just putting the team on his shoulders, this team is going to be really, really, really good. That's something certainly to get certainly to get excited about, Ryan. There's no doubt about that. Rob Osgood, happy Friday, IB Nation. So far, who, in your opinion, uh, who, uh, who, which coach has impressed you the most on the recruiting trail? That's for you, Ryan. Is is it tough that that is it bad that that's a really tough question to answer? In my opinion, I mean, I guess it's Marcus Freeman. I mean, I, he would have to be my answer, I guess. I mean, we're Chad, talking just Chad Bowden. Right? Chad Bowden, yeah, right. he deserves a big, big ups in that department. I, I think for me. I would I would say the easy answer though it is is Coach Freeman because not only is he a dynamic recruiter and he's showed his chops continuously he's always he's already he's also hired some other good dynamic recruiters right so they're kind of an extension of him to a degree if you're asking me just assistant coaches I would probably go with. I don't even know, man. It's so it's so tough, honestly. I, I mean, I'm thinking like Harry Heaston uh, has gotten six guys in the in the next two cycles, right? I think Al Washington has his moments. Chancey Stuckey, I think, deserves some big ups for what he has done. But I mean, he's had a he's had a miss already, right? Like, and sure, it, and everybody will, right? Right. Sure. Can sure. I can I give one that we're that we're yeah. not talking about because we're focused so much on the new coaches? Because he just sure. said which coach has impressed you. Mike Mickens is not getting nearly enough credit for the job he's done in 22 and 23 recruiting corners. I mean, he's going to have three guys, in my opinion, that should have been surefire top 100 players, in my opinion. Uh, two for sure, two others that are borderline, because I think Benjamin Morrison's a top 100 guy. I got Micah Bell's a top 100 guy, and I have Jaden Mickey and Christian Gray's borderline top 100 guys. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that that, that can't be and, – and it's there's speed, there's confidence, there's length, and he signed guys from St. Louis – Texas, at Phoenix area, and California. So it's not like they lucked out and there happened to be a really good corner from Fort Wayne, you know what I mean, or Chicago or, or Andrean and Maryville or something like that. He's going down into the backyard of the big boys. And let's think about who he's beat for the – he beat Ohio State and LSU for Christian Gray. He beat Alabama and Washington for Benjamin Morrison. And at the time, Jimmy Lake was still the coach at Washington. And there is nobody in the country other than maybe Bama – the last five years that has produced more cornerbacks in the NFL than Jimmy Lake, just yep. corners, right? Cause he was the corners yep. coach. And then, you know, Jaden Mickey, they got him really early and, and they beat out a lot of West coast schools for him. And the funny thing is Jaden Mickey was the least heavily recruited of all those kids. And mm-hmm. he's been super impressive. So Mike Mickens is not getting nearly enough credit for the job he's done the last two years. And the 2024 cornerback board is incredibly impressive. So, uh, Ryan, you m- nailed all like the, all the new coaches to a degree are showing a good doing a good job, but I think a returning coach isn't getting enough credit for how good of a job he's doing on the recruiting trail I- I- as well. That would that's that a, would be a response I would have. That's a really good one. I I, I mean I, I think he's so underrated that I even underrated him in my response. Well, right? I like, think your focus is more on head. the new guys. Yeah, that's where yeah. I, I you know kind of read your comment. It's kind of looking at the new guys yeah. Yeah. on the staff, which makes sense. I mean, I, I get that. I get that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he's done a he's done a really really good job. We'll stay on the recruiting chair real quick. Ryan Brandon Plesner asks, "How uh, any update in the Jeremiah Love recruitment? How are we feeling?" Brandon, so the last thing, and, and you know, we we put a little bit of an update on the board a while ago. But the last thing was, I think the the remaining big hurdle for well, at least from a visit perspective, was Texas A and M, which was not this past weekend, the weekend before for Jeremiah Love. And we after speaking with Jeremiah after the visit. I left the conversation feeling that Notre Dame is still the leader in the clubhouse. And the fact of the matter is, is I think that unless Notre Dame came out, unless Jeremiah Love came out of that visit and someone had overtaken Notre Dame, Mm -hmm. I feel good about Notre Dame standing in this one. So we should have some clarity on this soon. Like I said, he's, he's a guy that wanted to have this announced before the end of August. So that should be sometime in the next couple weeks. I would imagine 
I think Notre Dame is still the leader. And I, I think this one is trending and has continued to trend in the right direction. Teams like Texas A&M have made this a battle. There's no doubt about it. But I think I, there's some doubt about it. You think so? I do because I don't think – I mean, to make it a battle, yeah. to me, it's got to be like what happened with Clemson and Ronan Hannafin or LSU and Ohio State and Christian Gray. At any point in time over the last month and a half, two months, did you ever feel like A&M had closed the gap or taken the lead? No. No. Yeah, that's a good point. That's no. Good point. Yeah. So I get what you're saying and you're being yeah. fair, but no, I like there was a report two weeks ago that AM was a leader. And I was like, no, nah, that's not what I'm hearing. And so I had that's you get I'm on it. And Jay, Jeremiah was like, no, like, I mean, it was like, of course, like Notre Dame's definitely my leader. It's like, okay. Yes. I don't know where this stuff's coming from. I really don't. Yeah. Uh, but, and Ryan, you've even reached out to some people that, that, that are around AM and they think Notre Dame is the leader from what yes. you've, what you've heard from people as well. So, yeah. I mean, that's the most recent thing, honestly, Brandon, is that, people on a ms recruiting side of things still think Notre Dame's the leader. And sure. if that is the case, then I'm not worried at all about yeah. it. I mean, honestly, full transparency, the team that had me most nervous for a while was Alabama, but yep. that was before Richard Young and Justice Haynes, Hayes both landed with Alabama. So Michigan, I know, has done a pretty good job in spurts. I think A&M has made him have to think a little bit, you know, may- maybe not as much as I was originally portraying, but I do think – I think Notre Dame is the leader. Unless something else completely changes, yeah. I think they'll be in a good spot heading towards decision day. The only thing that could change is that's yes. it. Yes. That's it. They'd have to make something huge. Now, you said something interesting. You said Michigan did a really good job. And I have mm-hmm. we have said that in conversations either here or you and I privately yep. several times with a lot of – Michigan did a really nice job here, but – and it still blows my mind – that they are struggling this bad, they're mm-hmm. working hard. I mean, they worked hard to get Charles Jackson. They didn't have a chance. They worked hard with Jeremiah Love, and they're just not going to have a chance. They did a great job with, with Jaden Osbury, and it just they were never going to get him. Yeah. It's really fascinating that a team that just made the playoff, who actually has coaches that, from what we can tell, because how we view it is, mm-hmm. every time we talk to kids, we hear them mention Michigan, and they like the coaches, and the coaches have done a good job, but I'm not going there. And they're usually not even the top two. And, you know, it's, it's really weird. Like, and I, and I, and I wonder why I think, I think we have an idea why, but I've never seen anything like this. A team that had so much success, return their head coach and just on field success, draft success, and just completely fell up, fell fall off. apart as a recruiting yeah. operation like that next off season. It's really wild. and fast. I would love someone whenever, whenever the, Jim Harbaugh era does kind of end. I would love to kind of some recollection just of this off season and the recruiting side of things. I think that would be a fit, a just, I think that would be a, a really intriguing article that I would love to just read Mm -hmm. just kind of the mishaps and the stunting of, of momentum and all that would be a great read in my opinion. So I look forward Mm -hmm. to kind of seeing the inner workings of that, Brian, because I mean, we could speculate, but we, I think you hit a nail on the head, the uncertainty with the coach and the flirt mm-hmm. with the NFL. Like it had to completely kill the momentum this offseason. Yep. Jack Reacher's elbow with a super chat. If Notre Dame beats Ohio State by a fair amount, uh, not a blowout or squeaker, what is the reaction by national media and rivals? Respect or excuses for Ohio State? I think probably a little bit of both. It's it's always both, in my opinion. So, like, some people will say, like, Ohio State's overrated if they lose to a Notre Dame team. But then they'll also – there will be some people that will be like, oh, Notre Dame's – because yeah. Marcus Freeman, right? If, if Brian Kelly was the coach and they beat Ohio State, they, I think they would still find excuses like oh, – 100%. 100%. They're, yeah. they're going to revert back. They're going to revert back. But the fact that it's a new Or coach, they would just crush Ohio State. How, yes. how bad Ohio State was, yes. yeah. Yes. But I think that there will be a decently even split if that happens, because now you'll be like, oh, well, Marcus Freeman must just be for real, right? Like this staff must be the real deal. Like this program's going in the right direction. So there's always going to be a little bit of both, but I would say it'd be more balanced than if it was still Brian Kelly as the head coach. Yeah. I think you're still going to have some people that will just not give Notre Dame any credit. I mean, that's always going to happen. They could go 14 and 0 this year, folks. And there's going to be people, especially at ESPN and on the SEC network, that'll just say, well, they only did that because they were fresher than whatever SEC team they beat because their schedule wasn't as tough. I mean, you, you get it all. It's the same crap that you hear from those people when Clemson was beating SEC teams every year. Because, yes, yeah, Clemson beat Bama twice for titles, Ryan, but they beat at least one or two SEC teams almost every year. 
in the regular season because they beat South Carolina then. And then they remember they were beating Georgia a couple times. They beat they beat Auburn the year that they won the first title. They beat Texas A&M the year they won the second title on the road. And you hear the same stuff. Wow, oh, the schedule's soft, and that's why they were fresher, blah, 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 blah. And just You're always going to have that. But I think people that are honest and, and have some level of integrity it, are a little bit above. And honestly, it should be. If Notre Dame goes into Columbus and, and smacks Ohio State pretty con- convincingly, I think it says a lot about Notre Dame, but I do think it's a bad sign for Ohio State. I, I don't sure. think that's a good thing. Now, is it something where I'm going to say, uh-oh, Ryan Day's tenure's up? No, let's see how they respond, right? Because, you know, they got smacked in the mouth at home by Virginia Tech the last time they won a national championship. It, stuff happens. But I don't think that's a good sign for Ryan Day, to be honest with you, if they get smacked by Notre Dame. I, I don't anticipate that happening, though. I, I I think Notre Dame can win this game. There's no doubt, but it's not. It's it's going to be a battle, in my opinion. It, it is. Yeah. And they're going to have yeah. to have some I don't breaks. Think, I don't think it's going to be. That's why I pushed back against the point spread so much because I just I don't think this is going to be a one sided affair either way. No matter how yeah. this goes, I don't think it's going to be a non competitive game. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yep, I agree. We have some some interesting questions here. Um, Brendan K, what have you learned about growing a business? Uh, what have you learned about how to run a sports podcast? Um, Brandon, that's Brandon. That's a good question. Uh, what have I learned about growing a business? I mean, I've learned a ton. I mean, I could literally do a three-hour show on the things that I've learned doing a business. Uh, I think the biggest thing for me, and Ryan, I'm curious about your thoughts on this because I've shared a lot of my vision and the things that I've done is have have a plan that you believe in and stick to it. Be willing to adapt and grow as long as the vision doesn't change. Because that's the thing is you go and I think I'm going to do this and then, you know, maybe I need to go this way. You need to be adaptable, but you can't adapt your vision. You can't adapt your passion. And that's the thing is I've had a lot of people tell me you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't make money doing this. I had people like most of the people that I reached out to when I thought about starting this YouTube channel. I was like, no, don't do it. It's not worth the time. You can't make money doing it. And and then you, know, you don't do a podcast. You can't make money doing it. Well, Ryan, you know what we're doing in both of those. And, and, and I'm glad that I listened to my gut. But it's trust your gut. Be passionate about something. Have a plan. Stick to it, and then be fiscally responsible is the other thing. And and, and that, that's not something I would say I learned. I think that's something that's helped us. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't. I haven't taken out any loans. I don't have any debt. If I decided tomorrow to walk away, I wouldn't know a dime. You know, other than paying Ryan's salary. You know, so uh, I mean, that's a big thing. Is just just you know have a plan, think it through, stick to it, and and be adaptable to to the way things go. And I mean, it, for, for me, it was tough, uh, you know, gosh, five months after taking over COVID hit mm-hmm. and I'm running a sports site that doesn't, isn't talking sports. There's no sports to talk about, you know, but I had a vision. I stuck through it. We got, we had some really tough months at, at you know, for my family, but you know, my wife owns a business as well. We were able to kind of power through and, and make it work and make sacrifices. And, and eventually the, the plan has worked out, worked. And so, you know, that's my thing is, you know, have a clear thought out plan, be convicted about it and stick, stick to it. Don't, and don't let other people who don't, don't let other people who have failed at something convince you that the way you want to do it doesn't work because they may have failed for different reasons. As long as you've really thought it out and done all the homework and the research and, and, and have a, you know, you've got to try, look, there's no way you can be prepared for every scenario. Right. But Try your best. Like I thought, okay, but what happens if in five months a global pandemic happens and I don't have any sports to talk about? (laughs) Didn't cross my mind. It was not part of my preparation. You know, but my wife and I had to do a lot of planning before we started this. And I had kind of known for a while that I eventually wanted to do go on my own. And um, so far it's worked, but, you know, stick to your guns. And then he had a follow-up. How has your style of delivering this content changed over the years? What have you learned as a sports personality that you wish you knew when you started? I I wish I would have learned more from Lou Samoji very early on about engaging with people in a certain way. And I'm still a, I can still be abrasive. That's just my personality. I don't I don't have Lou's heart. I don't have his genuine kindness. I don't think I have that. The the sort of the 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 he can just he could have someone yelling at him and he's just going to be like, "Well, I understand." I Appreciate you sharing that with me. And that's just who he was. Or if you're in my face yelling at me, he's like, uh, you might want to back off because I'm about to start swinging. I just, I have that rough of personality. But especially when he passed and I just saw the genuine love and respect people had for him, I was like, you know, if I, if I pass tomorrow, 
you know, I think there'd be like a, you know, a Driscoll really knew football, but, and then dot, dot, insert, he's a jerk, he's this, he's that, and the other thing. And to a degree, it's like, I'm always going to be me. But as you sat back and think about it, I was like, you know, do I really need to like argue with every person who has a different opinion than mine? Do I really need to be this aggressive at this opinion? Do I really need to respond to everything on Twitter? Do I really need to do all these kind of things? Or can I just sit back and say, you know what, man, like, I'm just going to create it. I'm just going to be more mild. And I mean, Ryan, you and I've had this conversation because you're kind of sometimes where I was, you know, and it's just like, you know, like, look, you don't, I don't need to win this battle. It's okay. Like this person's not hurting anybody by having a different opinion of mine. And so I think that's the thing from the style that's changed is, is like, you know, I think I'm more mild, you know, in, in, in my reactions, I I've learned to say, Hey, get your two points in and then end it. That's kind of my new rule on debating people on message boards. I make one counter or second counter. And for the most part, unless it's just good football talk, but if I'm, mm-hmm. if I'm arguing with you after the second one, I've said what I need to say, I need to keep repeating it. It's, it's good to go. Um, I think those are things that I've, to me, I've, I've learned about it because now I am the face of Irish breakdown. And if I'm a prick all the time, then guess what? People are going to be like, well, I don't go Irish breakdown. Cause that place is, you know, just, it's not a cool place to be. And, so I want to debate and argue and I want to create that thought, but you know, you don't need to have to win every argument. You don't have to be so aggressively trying to win arguments. And I think those are things that I've learned. Ryan's smirking because he and I have had that conversation. <laughs> so I'm um, still learning. Yeah. I'm still learning. Yeah. Leave it there. <laughs> and then last one, Brandon says, what was the most pivotal decision you've had to make regarding Irish breakdown? There's two, and I'm not just saying this for, because of present company, but number one was, do I want to keep doing this? And, and that was the big thing for me is, and I think every business that starts up the way that I did, which is I didn't take out any loans. I didn't take out any, any, uh, I didn't have any investors. I mean, I started this with zero, you know, basically it was just my vision and my ability and, and, you know, having, you know, eventually Vince came over pretty soon, but at the very beginning, it was just me. And, and so is this going to work or not? And, you know, after the first year, you know, because of COVID, it's like, if this continues much longer, I mean, we're going to be in trouble. And I actually did at one point in time consider some pretty dramatic financial steps, decided not to. I prayed a lot about it. I had faith in God that, that you know, hey, look, I got you. You don't need to go to this bank. You don't need to go to this person. You don't need to make this decision. You don't need to see that lawyer. Just I got you. And so I sat back and said, OK, I'm going to keep plugging away. And I think the decision to keep plugging away and not either quit or go away from what I had said of not taking out loans and doing those type of things uh, to grow was the best decision I ever made because pretty soon after that, it took off. And and I t- truly believe that that was a blessing. I, I, I'm humbled by that. It's not a look how great I am. I do believe God has opened doors for me. I genuinely believe that and, and got us through some really tough times as a family and as a business. And the second one was hiring Ryan because it required me to take a gamble in a way that that I wasn't necessarily comfortable doing, meaning I had proje- I had to project where I thought the business was going to be this year based on what we had done. And what we had kind of done the previous year wasn't going to be enough to pay Ryan what I needed to pay him. But I had faith in y'all. I had faith in the vision that, you know, we're going to be okay. And so when, when I decided to hire Ryan, it was a, it was a risk. It was a gamble because I, I, you know, I can pay him, but can, I can still pay myself, you know, that kind of thing. And right when we hired him, just, we took off and it's been great. And, you know, and, and, but that's another one because it's allowed me hiring him and him putting out content has allowed me to start working on other projects and doing some other things, growing our team in other ways that has resulted in us really taking off. So uh, those are the two things that, that, um, you know, not really giving away secrets. I'm just kind of telling you, and then, you know, just be willing to, like I said, the most pivotal decision is just be willing to see it through, stick with it, you know, and, um, and we're lucky, like we don't have kids. So it's like when times got tough, we didn't have kids we had to feed and things like that. So it was easier for us to, to go through that in my opinion. Um, David Fryman says, uh, just gave my buddy a new IB hat and mug for his birthday. Everyone should do the same Buy merch. I agree. We have the link to the shop right below. Here's a really fascinating question, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Brian and Ryan, let's say the Notre Dame Ohio State game is delayed two hours because of a thunderstorm. Does that affect either team positively or negatively? 
I mean, it can affect them. It can affect both negatively a little bit, right? Like the adrenaline's kind of run out a little bit, you know, kind of leading up to mm-hmm. the game. I would say that it would affect Ohio State a little more negatively just because it's a home game. And that can mm-hmm. really, I think, affect a little bit of like the kind of the morale and the electricity in the air for them positively. I, I don't think it really affects any, either one positively, right? Like I, I think that either way you're – kind of losing a little bit of your juice. You're having the weight to play football. Like, I, I don't think it affects either one very positively. I would just say the negatives, I think, would actually hurt Ohio State a little bit more, but I think it does affect both negatively if we're talking about just the adrenaline starting to wear off. You know, two hours is a long time to just sit there and wait and yeah. have to play football. Like It's a long yep. time. I'm going to say this, Ryan. I mm-hmm. think it benefits Notre Dame. And the reason I say that is, is we saw we've seen this. We've seen this happen. We saw this happen against South Florida in 2011. It was halftime, but they came out of the second half, and not only was – like both teams were kind of flat, yeah. but there was no energy in the stadium. It was half empty. Dead. Like all the momentum was – I mean, it was it was just like – and that's the thing with, with Ohio State is one of the disadvantages that would face Notre Dame is it's going to be a wild atmosphere. If it's okay. delayed two hours because of thunderstorms, there will be people that leave. Most likely won't be the Notre Dame fans, you know what I mean? Exactly. And, and a exactly. lot of the energy will be kind of sapped out a little bit, and and so I think that would then it comes down to just two teams playing, you know. But uh, I, I do I do think it would be would benefit Notre Dame more, but I hope we don't get there because I don't want anything to happen to where it's like, well, Notre Dame only won because of insert excuse, right? Or Ohio State blew Notre Dame out or beat Notre Dame because of insert excuse i want whatever the outcome to be to be because that's just where it was what those teams were that day not because of any other you know potential excuses that people may 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 get to i I guess one positive to ohio state slightly would be at least like you're you're more comfortable in your surroundings so i guess if you have to like just chill for a little bit it's like okay I, i know like where my where my zone is around here i know where to kind of just lay down and just relax for a few minutes so i guess that could be just having having the home surroundings but like for the most part i think just deflating a home crowd would be just that's that's the biggest mm-hmm. disadvantage for me yeah yep let's see here uh, i want to respond to brandon says brian is your confidence in the jeremiah love recruitment stemming from sources on the notre dame side of things or love side of if you can comment both uh, ATM and Indy staffs feel confident in locking in his commitment. I, I don't, that's not necessarily the read that we get. And so first of all, Brandon, I think you know this by now, we almost never give you our opinion based on one source, almost never. And the only time we do, it's because the source is the person that's been, that we're given the update on, right? Like I don't need to get confirmation if a recruit tells me something about <laughs> his feelings, right? I don't need to, well, is this what, you know, it, it, you know, that's kind of what it is. But in this instance, it comes from all over. It, it, there's not just one source. We have talked to many sources about this question. So unless unless this kid's flat lying to somebody, I don't see what some people are saying on our board others are reporting. You know, I just – I don't see it that way. If, yeah. if it's trending that way, then I'm going to have to have a talk with someone at the right. end of this whole right. situation because right. I – yeah, I wish I could and so share a lot of other people. some of the intel. Yeah, yeah exactly. So <laughs> I just, you know, again, I'm, I'm not saying somebody's given bad intel, somebody's lying. Somebody's, I'm not saying any of that. I think what's being reported is probably what some people are being told. At least one yeah. of the people that I know is reporting A&M is not someone that I think is a hack like the other people that, that, that the national people that I that I go off on. But we're just we're just not hearing that. And as far as the ATM staff feeling confident. I mean, like Ryan, you reached out to somebody yesterday, and that's not necessarily the vibe that you heard, correct? Yeah, yeah no. From the on, 18, on, from the A and M side of things. Yes. Yeah. On, on their side of things, again, it's been consistent that they think Notre Dame's the leader. Right. And coming out of the visit, if Notre Dame is still the leader, I feel pretty good about where that's trending. Like just right. I, I mean, pretty cut and dry there, you know. Like they yeah. had to I think if A and M was really a, a I think if A and M pushed it to like if they came out and they were the absolute leader now then this is a completely different conversation. But the fact that they didn't close the gap fully, in my opinion, tells me that Notre Dame is still in a good spot. Uh, yep, I agree. Let's get to some more questions. You got some, you all are just really brought it today. We got a World War II question from Rob Osgood. And I have it's all uh, you, man. Yes, yes. 
<laughs> uh, history question. What was the best tank of the war of World War World War II? Panther, Tiger, Sherman, or T-32? Um, I'd probably go the Panther, probably the Panther or the Tiger. I think those are the two most effective. Look, the reality is the Sherman was not a great tank, and there's been a lot of discussion about that. What it did have, however, was a lot of them. And they had great tactics. I think that helped. The reason that the Allies had so much trouble in North Africa early in the war is because of Rommel had the combination of great tanks and, and really good tactics. Eventually, like once Patton and the Americans kind of got into Europe, they had some really good success because the American tanks were still way better than the British tanks. Uh, but they just were able to mass produce. I mean, that's a big part of what the war was. It's the same thing in Japan. I mean, and, and we've talked about this in the Pacific fight is eventually Jap Japan ran out of pilots and they ran out of, you know, they couldn't mass produce aircraft carriers the way that the United States could mass produce aircraft carriers. So like when they would, when they would have, uh, you know, four, they have four carriers sunk at Midway, they couldn't just replace them in a period of time like the United States could. And of course, much bigger population. So, you know, we were able to draw in more pilots where their pilots were just, and they, had, they dominated from a, a, a experience standpoint early on because they had been fighting Russia and China and their pilots had a lot more experience. And we're just putting out young flyers. Guys have been flying over their farms and, and stuff like that early on. So they were really good flyers, but they didn't have the battle experience. But we were just able to throw so much at them. Same thing with the Germans. I mean, 10 Shermans are going to beat two Panthers kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like no matter how superior the tank is, eventually, back then at least, you could just be overwhelmed by numbers. And I think that was a big part of it. And so, you know, I think whether it's Panther or Tiger depends on where you read and who you talk to. But I think those are probably the two most, um, the two best tanks, you know, most effective tanks, I should say, uh, from the World War II period. And they were both German tanks, by the way. Uh, but that was the issue Germany was always going to have. It was just they, they like once they brought – the United States into the war because well, Japan brought them into the war. And then Germany, for some stupid reason, uh, went out and declared war on the United States before, which like allowed us to just kind of, okay, we're well, now we're not going to hide. We've been involved. We've been given aid and weapons to the British and the allies. But then it was just like, okay, you just, you couldn't match the numbers and the technological and advancements. And then the fact that, you know, women and minorities who weren't able to fight, went into the factories and did a tremendous job of making sure that our troops were armed and had the equipment, all those kind of things. I mean, the country truly rallied together and the industrial might of the United States was just unmatched at the time. And that's really ultimately what, what, what ended it. And of course we had some really good generals. I mean, we had some really good leadership. Eisenhower was really good. Uh, Nimitz had some really good strategy at West. We had some other great generals that could carry, you know, Patton was a, a savant when it came to tactics, you know, tank tactics and tank strategy. And ultimately, those are the things that that uh, won it, um, you know, for the, the allies. I mean, one of the many reasons, in my opinion, that won it for the allies. So there you go. So we won't go too deep into the World War II questions, but I did want to answer that because I'm always fascinated by those questions. You know that, Ryan. Oh, yeah. USMA 87. Ryan, what are your thoughts on Sam Hartman's draft prospects? Obviously, you want to just kind of update on where things are, which is why this question is being asked. Yeah, I mean, so unfortunately, he's dealing with a – it's, it's a non-disclosed medical issue. And what that means is just pure speculation at this point. Me and Brian have talked about like a couple of things that maybe it could be, you know, just kind of speculating about it, but nobody knows right now. All we know that is that, you know, from a, from a future perspective, it's just a big cloud right now. Like we have no idea mm -hmm. what's happening with Sam Hartman before this whole popped up. I would say, that from grades that I've seen in just general understanding, I would say that Sam Hartman is pretty well liked by the NFL. I, I think that he was having between fourth to sixth round type of conversations. I think he's a little overhyped from as a NFL draft prospect, because mm -hmm. I just don't see a great arm. Like I think that he's got really middling to below average arm strength and he's a tough kid. He's got kind of that gamer stuff too, that we talked about with Colt McCoy, right? And he's a great college quarterback, a really good college mm -hmm. quarterback. There's no doubt. I think that he's at best a backup option at the NFL level, but of course we have to figure out what's going on with the medical stuff. Cause that's a big mm -hmm. layer to the NFL draft process as well, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. wishing him all the best though. Cause he's, yeah. a, he's great for college football. Yeah. He's a young man. So I hope that everything medically checks out and he's back on, back on the mend here pretty soon. Hopefully. Yeah. You just hope that whatever's going on is not a permanent issue. 
you know, that it's something that, hey, this has just happened. And once it's over, it's, you know, it's it's done and won't be something that comes back or, you know, whatever it is. So I don't want to speculate on it too much because we just don't know what it was. And that would be un, uh, unwise, unfair and irresponsible. So we're not going to do that. Let's see here. Let's get down to uh, Milton fan 15 question. Do, what difference do you see in attitude, intensity and player effort from last year to this year? Honestly, Milton, it's 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 hard to say beyond what we've already said this summer, where in the spring we saw a lot more intensity, a lot more fire and passion. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, we've been to like five practices so far and they're for the first five periods. It's like special teams and, and individual uh, stretch. That's it. It, you're not really you can't judge what a team is by those periods so we don't get to see that the the team practices the seven on sevens the one-on-ones we don't get to see what the competition is like in those periods in the past during the first five sometimes we get like we usually get like a one-on-one -on -one or two a period or two we're just not seeing those this year so it's really hard to say uh what it's like if i'm being if i'm being responsible i just say look refer to what we said in the spring a lot more fire a lot more energy a lot more passion i don't know if that's carried in the fall because we just haven't seen enough of it to be completely honest with you. Mm -hmm. USMA says, is CJ Stroud going to be the Spencer Rattler of last year from a Heisman hype perspective, especially if Notre Dame wins on 9-3? Very doubtful, very doubtful. I, yeah. so look, the thing with Spencer Rattler is, is Spencer Rattler is very talented. There's no doubt. But his personality is very volatile, right? And yeah. that's kind of where the volatility of play came into effect. CJ Stroud is a very cool calm collected type of player it seems right and he's in a good system under a good offensive coach and he has a lot of good structure around him and he seems like a very well-spoken young man so i don't have volatility about cj stroud from a mental side of things mm -hmm. you always had that with, with spencer rattler i mean spencer rattler's that guy where if everything clicks he's incredibly talented right mm -hmm. but i think what made cj stroud so improved down the stretch and just a such a successful football player last year is the mental side, I think, is really a mm -hmm. little advanced compared to yeah. Spencer Rattler. So I would just say the maturity level is the biggest difference. I don't think I don't see CJ Stroud taking that type of slide. Agree. I think the system is better suits him really well. He's got great talent around him. I think those things alone would make it hard for him to take that kind of drop. I think I think the difference is is Spencer Rattler was never as good as the hype about him was. No. That's not true. CJ Stroud's already shown he's that good. And and uh like I said, by the end of the year, like that, he was really good. Like they didn't yeah. lose to Michigan because of CJ Stroud. I mean, they, yeah. and if it wasn't for CJ Stroud, they might have lost a couple more games. Let's be honest. If he doesn't just, just, I mean, he was, we've talked about the issues against Utah, Utah, all the mm -hmm. injuries, but that doesn't take away from how good CJ Stroud was in that game. 100%. He was really good in that game. It just, but, but again, if Utah is not banged up, that might not, it might not have been enough. I mean, you know, but but he he was really good in that game because Ka Cameron Re Rising was uh, was tearing up. He Ohio was State's yes team early yes. on. So. Yes, yep, yep, absolutely. All right, let's get to some more. Uh, Ryan, this is for you. Sam Tyrell, mm -hmm. does Notre Dame have four legitimate NFL players on their offensive line? I think this is meant to include the starting lineup. So yes. like not oh, projecting so the future. Five. Yeah, I, I think so because I, I, that's what I would. Yeah, I, I think so because if we're going to talk about future, then. You know, I mean, you, you could talk about like the 2017 offensive line had like, what, eight, nine, yeah. something like that, you know, yeah. like, so, um, yeah, just let's go with the starting offensive line. Okay. So if we're running off the assumption that it ends up being Joe Walt, Jared Patterson, Zeke Corral, Josh Lug, Blake Fisher, I would say you have three without question, right? You have, well, let me rephrase. You have three starting players at the next level, I believe, most likely. You have... Blake Fisher, Joe Walt, who I think are both have that upside to being very good players at the next level. I think you have Jared Patterson, who also has starter upside on the next level. The biggest questions now, Sam, is like if you're asking me fringe players that could hold on to a roster, you could sell me Josh Luck could be mm -hmm. a fringe rosterable player. I don't think he's ever going to be a starter at the next level, but like we've seen a couple of Notre Dame offensive linemen who weren't stars at the Notre Dame level that have, you know, had a role for a year, at, mm -hmm. at least, you know, kind of fighting for some backup opportunities. So between Corral and Lug, I think both players have the potential to being rosterable players. I don't see starter upside. 
And right now, like, they're both not draftable players by any sense. Like, Josh Lugg is not going to be drafted right now based upon the film, in my opinion. But could he be a UDFA or priority free agent that sticks on a roster or on a practice squad? It's possible. But I would say three, Mm -hmm. no doubt, NFL players. And then you might have a a fringe rosterable player at the end there. I love this response right here from our World War II conversation. We had Captain America. They were cooked. Oh, 100%. (laughs) 100%. We, we all saw it. We all saw it. Yep. <laughs> That's great. That is a great, great response. I, I wanted to respond to this here real quick. A couple things down here real quick. Uh, Sam Tyrell, Brian, did you personally go watch practice? No, I did not. I will not be at any practices or home games this year in the press box. So uh, that is Sean Styers. Uh, Vince is there. And then Vince couldn't go yesterday. So his uh, former offensive line coach, Chris Summers, went. And that's why. We did the O-line film yesterday because Chris does a good job. He knows what to look for, and he knows the angles to look uh, to get good offensive line video. So anytime Chris goes to practice, I always have him do an offensive line video, which is why we went to – we did the one yesterday. He did a really good job, so I'm, I'm thankful to him. He actually coaches uh, football pen, uh, oh, which nice. is, yeah, around here. So then Paul Rose asked, Brian, have you taken your P365XL to the range yet? I have, and it is beautiful. It shoots incredibly well. Um, very accurate, very clean, had no issues with it. And, uh, it is now my carry pistol. So yes, I have taken it to the range. Very happy with it. I also got some new mags the other day for it. So now I'm, I'm all set, man. I had that got bought the 15 round extender. So I, uh, I'm good to go, buddy. Yes, I have taken it to the range. Thanks for asking. He knows that I'm a, I'm a sick guy. Quinn Kelly asks, are you guys fans of high schools running triple options? Yes, I am. I, if that's Ryan's always a them. fan of it. Well, high school is a different not, animal. actually yeah. i just got it's, it's yeah. kind of our shtick that i, I mess yeah. with you a little bit but yeah. i mean if that's what you have yeah, yeah quinn like yeah. if you have undersized offensive linemen right. and you don't have a great passing quarterback but like he's a decent runner and yep. yeah 100 if that's what you have i mean i've yep. been on teams that ran, and it works for you yeah 100 yeah, i've seen team i've been on teams that have run power i i've been on teams that have run single wing i've been on teams that well not as much triple option but like on defensive side of the football i've been on teams that have run a 4-4 or 5-2 i'm open to whatever on the high school level because you need to maximize your talent as long as you can teach it don't have much of it (laughs) yeah and i think i think it can be hard to run a triple option if you're at a high school that doesn't isn't a feeder program i think that's the other thing it can be a little challenging so if you're in like especially at a smaller high school where the same kid like this is where it was where i grew up in, in 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 lima it was Bath Elementary, Bath Middle, Bath High School. That was it. I mean, we were all grew up together. You know, so when we're playing junior high football, we're running the same, basically kind of the same kind of principles that they were running on varsity. So by the time you went to varsity, you were kind of running the same system your whole life. I don't know if it's like that now, but it was like that when I was a kid. Yeah. And and so you, you sh- usually they keep that stuff uniform because it's if like you can. an easy transition. Yeah, if you yeah. can, and, you yeah. know, but it's – uh. Yeah, I mean, look, whatever works, as long as you can teach it, the kids like it, and it's, it works for you, sure, go for it. Because high school, like I said, high school is a different animal. I mean, yeah, you want to say, hey, you know, you should do things or help kids get to college. That's not a high school coach's job it, directly. There are things you can do with whatever offense you're doing that are going to help kids get to the next level, right? And you should take pride in that, but you're not building your system around what's going to help kids go play college football. Otherwise, you may not have a job to do that. Your job is to teach kids how to play, teach kids to be, to help develop them as young men and do all, but as far as the specific X's and O's, it's what's going to win you football games. I mean, those are things that to me are, are, are important in my opinion. Next question. Uh, Irish shy town, Brian, if you were the offensive coordinator, what offense would you run? Ryan, I'm going to let you ask, answer that one first and then I'll answer it second. Brian and shy town. I thank you for starting to finally a- ask me some questions. I appreciate that. So I, I what would, would you run? run? Yeah, I, I would have elements of pro style. So it'd be a little more like a pro style spread, right? Like I, mm-hmm. I want, I kind of want a little bit of both worlds at points, but I'd be a heavy inside zone system, some duo. That would kind of be the mostly the run scheme that I would work with today. But I, yeah, I would say pro style spread would probably be my preferred. Mm-hmm. I agree. I am, a, I am a, so first of all, my system would be kind of the same. I am a fan of a base being 11 personnel pro style offense. That's just kind of where I'm at. I am a shotgun guy, but I also like being able to mix it up and go under center. So some of the things they've done in recent years, I haven't had an issue with uh, as far as this alignment. I just felt like if you're going to go under center, one of the things I liked about Chip Long and especially Tommy Reese 
is if you're going to be a pro style team that's not snapping the ball early, you better be moving your personnel motion shifts, all that other kind of stuff around, trying to gain leverage, trying to do all, get isolations, trying to gain gain numbers advantage, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that would be me. I do like the shotgun. I, I prefer a quarterback that can at least do some things from a mobile standpoint. Don't require it to be a, a runner per se, you know. But uh, but I'd be I'd be easily able to adapt a guy that can do the RPOs. I, I love RPOs. As soon as I saw him, I was like, I love that kind of stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. But that would be my thing. I like I like isolations. I like levels. I like throwing levels a lot. I'm not necessarily in, uh, like one thing I didn't like about Brian Kelly's pass offense was very one on one oriented. I didn't like that, uh, where it's just more horizontal stretches. I'm more of a vertical stretch guy, Ryan. I like using, you know, vertical stretch to kind of run guys off, bring free guys up, you know, stack stuff on, create triangles and, and meshes and that kind of stuff is kind of always how I've been in the past game. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't mind setting up an ISO, but I kind of like if I'm going to run a vertical route that I want to set up or horizontal stretch type of thing, I would rather kind of use my motions and shifts to get a guy isolated to where we're in a matchup that we like for that particular route, as opposed to, you know, a lot of the, I mean, Notre Dame would run four verts a ton and, and variations off of it, where it just was like, was, you, you needed to have really good, smart players uh, for it to work. Otherwise it was just, it wasn't going to work as well. Yeah. So that would be, that would be my stance. Here's a good one from Irish high town best baseball movie. It is major league, and okay. it's not okay. particularly close, in my opinion. I disagree with the second part of your statement. I do think mm-hmm. it's close. Bull Durham is a great baseball movie. That is a really good movie. Yes, I, agree. yes. I, can, yes. I can get there. Yes, Field of Dreams is technically a baseball movie, but I don't consider it a baseball movie. It, if it's that a makes little, sense, it's a little right? overrated. Also, I don't think opinion. it's overrated. I think it's a great movie. If you're looking at it as a baseball movie, then yes, I could understand you feeling that way, but it's a great storyline. It's very well acted, and it's got Kevin Costner and James Earl Jones. Of course it's going to have, and, and Ray Liotta in it. So, you know, you had, you had a great cast. I liked Field of Dreams quite a bit. I just don't view it as a baseball movie per se. You know, it's more of like that was around the storyline. The storyline was something different. Oh. You know, reconnecting with your father, yeah, and all that yeah. other kind. Of, yeah, yeah, it was like really cool that. stuff, right? And yeah. uh, but it's not. I mean, I can't compare that to Major League and and Bull Durham and stuff like that. Uh, Major League was great. Bull Durham was was really good. It was. Yeah, really I haven't good. seen Bull Durham in a long yeah. time. I need to watch yeah. some more Nick Lelouch. Yeah, get back in there. Yeah. yeah, I just like the you know the the one of my favorite scenes is the manager goes in and crashes shaven, and he's like, you know, I you can't get these guys to do anything, and he's like, scare them. He's like, what? He goes, they're kids. Scare him. So he walks in there, throws the bat. He's the like, bats, get in the yeah. yeah, he's like, yeah. you lollygag the ball around the infield. You lollygag the ball around the bases. Yeah, and he's like, what does that make you, Larry? Lollygaggers. Lollygaggers. <laughs> <laughs> just such a great scene. What I like about those two movies is, to me, a great movie is one that just stands the test of time just from uh, appreciation over different generations. But also, is it quotable? Like the yes. thing I love about Major League and Bull Durham is it's got so many great pull, takeaway quotes that are just funny. Nice catch, Ace. Mm-hmm. Hey, don't ever effing do it again. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> there's just, you know what I mean? It's like you may hit like Hayes, May- or hey, you may uh, run like Hayes, but you hit like, you know, I mean, it's just so many great, so That's many great, great ones. Great movie, the second man. one was eh, you know, and then the other ones after that were just Ma- garbage. Major League Back to right. the Minors. You ever yeah. see Back to the oh, Minors? I did, unfortunately. It was unfortunately, so bad. I did. It was so it was so, so bad. bad. Where where um, what's his name? What what's the the Ophi Ophi catcher from the second one? Baker, right? Yeah, was yeah, to- Rue yeah, Rue Baker, yeah, yeah, and, Rue. Uh, and he came in into the second one and like as a minor. I'm like, this is right. stupid. Why yeah. why is this? It was really right bad. Now? It was yeah. really bad. It was really bad. There were some funny scenes in it, but like. Like you know, you got Omar Epps trying to play the character of the Wesley Snipes. It was, it was just not good. It was yeah, no, good. Wesley Snipes was so much better. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, I, I did like Wild Things role because I think I think getting Charlie Sheen to try to act proper like made that character <laughs> even better because he's just that's not him, and it's definitely not his character. I thought that was pretty good too. Oh pretty, man! And how do you go from being a player one year to an owner the next? Like, come on! Like with Dorn, it's yeah. just it was it was a more unbelievable premise. This the premise around it was a little bit less believable. Yeah. Uh, although I'm not usually someone who like likes, um, you know, 
like the believability, like, you know, oh, that's not realistic. I'm like, we're watching a superhero movie. And that that's the thing you find a pro you have a problem with, right? Like, okay. I, I, I liked um I liked in that movie, not a quote, but when um Eddie Harris, the pitcher, is yeah. like showing that he has like Vagisil yeah. and Barbasol and like, <laughs> yeah. all this stuff on him. <laughs> Are you telling me Jesus Christ couldn't hit a curveball? <laughs> like, I mean, that is the great greatest story. quote from that movie, if I'm being honest. It's fantastic. <laughs> that's a great movie. Let me send Rookie of the Year. That was that was good. It was all right. It was like more of a kid movie, you know. Yeah. Uh Mr. Baseball is good. It, I, have you ever seen Mr. Baseball with Tom Yeah, Sully? that's with um, what's his name, right? Serrano no, right. was in it, yeah. but is a different person. Yeah. Uh yeah. the guy that Dennis Hastert was in it, di- different character. I thought that was pretty good. I thought mm-hmm. that was pretty good. Obviously, yeah. Major League is a good one. Uh, the natural is a good one. Um, the yeah. natural is has is a little too dry for me at times. Yeah, uh, just the way that it is. But I mean, it's got some good parts in it. It, it just I can't sit down and just watch the natural again. Yeah. It just he wasn't kinda, a he wasn't no overly ex- what is it's um de- what was the the actor's name Robert Hopefully. Redford Robert Redford yeah, yeah he wasn't like a he wasn't like a very I don't want believable to say likeable, baseball player. Like, it was just like, oh, yeah. he was just he was like very dry. Like it was just like how yeah. he talked to everyone was just kind of the yeah. same tone. It's kind of a jerk. Like, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like kind of like not a, not the ideal hero. He's kind of like, you know, like kind of yeah. I I'm, I'm with yeah. you. Like I want to like him. He's kind of the good guy, but I don't really like him. Yeah. You know, yeah. but uh, a very underrated baseball movie, A League of Their Own. Oh, it's great. It's Tom Hanks. Great, fantastic. great yeah. baseball movie. Gina and it, Davis and Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Their their relationship between Gina Davis and Tom Hanks' dynamic yeah. was excellent. And That's I don't particularly movie. care for her very much as a human being, but mm-hmm. Rosie O'Donnell Madonna. Yeah, it's, they, 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 they were really the good. They, yeah, were they were did. really good. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed that movie. So, I think someone said in the chat, there's no crying in baseball. There's, there's no, no crying. There's no baseball. crying. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's just, just no crying. No crying. She's crying, sir. You know what I mean? It's just such a great movie. Oh my gosh. Hey, what, what's your, you know, whatever, what your name is. Like he doesn't remember the girl's name and they're having like the sign battle. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. and yeah. uh, oh, it was great, and but it also had some really heartwarming moments, and like some you know, it's like because mm-hmm. it was just like it was kind of based on a true story, right? And yeah, but yeah. like the scene of like why were they playing because the men were fighting the war. I mean, we talked war, about yeah. earlier, like you know, like the women had to step up and and do a lot of things, and other people had to step up and do a lot of things. And uh, you know, the scene where the, the telegram guy walks in and he's got a telegram for one of the women because their husband had just died. Mm-hmm. And just how they're all like petrified because they all had husbands fighting overseas. You just see the impact of of that. So, I mean, you had some of those moments, too, that were really funny. Like when May's teaching that lady how to read. What do oh, you yeah, what yeah. do you read? It doesn't matter. She's reading. That's all that matters. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, just, it was really good. It was really well done. For the oh, love of the so, game, I enjoyed too. Did you like yeah, that I'm movie? Say for love of yeah. the game with um, Kevin Costner, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. That was good. yeah. Somebody As, said um, uh, Angels in the Outfield. No. No, it, it was cool when I was a yeah. kid. Mm. It was cool when I was a kid. Little yeah. big league, yeah. Eh, you know, that sucked. Yeah, Sorry. that's the one where the kid took over as the manager. Yeah, nah. yeah. I didn't like that one very much. Not, uh, my, not my bag. Yeah, his mom. Yeah, his, was yeah. His mom was not unattractive in that movie though. Irish Shy Town, Bad News Bears. I didn't like any of those. I didn't like the old ones I, or the new ones. I was. I was going to say. I, I think. I think that. I think that the original Bad News Bears is slightly overrated. It was yeah. fine. It was fine. Yeah. Sandlot. I didn't even think about that one. That one's really. Sandlot's good. great. Yeah. It's movie. yeah yeah it's not in my top three but it's a really good one the, mm-hmm. it does have because to me like sandlot for me there's only mm-hmm. one scene there's only two scenes from there that are like memorable to me it's the mm-hmm. scene at the the pool with the lifeguard right <laughs> that's like every eight-year-old boy's dream right yes. and then the other one is the art the argument you know the, the the between the the baseball team and the uniform and the kids oh, playing yeah. street ball yeah. and then how the 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 te- the end co- the end co- inverse like the argument ender was sort of like it reminded me of like a Christmas story like I triple dog there like okay it's over like you know but you play ball like a girl you know it just was like oh, what what you say to me you know, yeah. it just was it was just which funny. is so funny because like we laugh about it but like you know if you were that age and someone said you'd be like excuse me yeah, exactly. what you say to me exactly. <laughs> And I had an incredibly athletic, talented sister, and it wouldn't have mattered. It just was the perception behind that comment. So, exactly. Yeah, it was uh, great, great. I just love some of these um, these takeaways from the the different movies, you know, that yeah. uh, and the different comments. The damn Yankees. Uh, did you ever watch Eight Men Out? Yes. Okay. Yep. I thought that was a pretty decent movie. Charlie Sheen's in that as well. Yeah. Yep. He is. You're right. He's in that. 
I only re- usually remember John Cusack's character in that movie, but yes, yeah, you are sure. correct. John Cusack's in that too. Yeah. Moneyball was okay. It was entertaining, but it's like not necessarily. It's, I'll tell you, it. I just kind of thought it just was a little, a little. Um, I'm trying Cheesy. to think. Like, yeah, yeah. Like mm-hmm. they t- combine like three years into one, and yeah. like the trade deadline thing. Like, I it's not that easy. Like, come no. on, man. Like, you know, no. it's like. No. You know, um, that's 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 like that's like um, draft day, right? It's just like that's yeah. not how that yeah. 100% works. But, so, but like, to me, I enjoy draft day more than Moneyball. There was just too many dry moments in Moneyball, and and I just yeah. never found Billy Bean to be very likable. Here's a good one: '61. That was a really good baseball movie. Have you ever seen about that? Roger, Roger about Maris Roger Maris and, and Mickey Mantle. Mm-hmm. Really, really well done. Yeah. Really well done. I'm trying mm-hmm. to see if there's any other good suggestions about it. I think, I think, oh, <laughs> Naked Gun, not a baseball movie. I've, n- I've but, never seen Naked Gun. I don't even know. Okay. You have to watch the baseball scene. Watching Leslie Nielsen <laughs> call three strikes, just that's all uh, I'm going to say to you, was one of the, I I don't know if I have ever laughed as hard as I, in my life, as I did watching that movie when he okay. was calling three strikes. He's like, first one, he's like, so basic premise, guy throws, he's, he's a, a, a cop and he's undercover and he's the official. He's the umpire, home plate umpire, and mm-hmm. some bad guy is like rigged. To, they're going to try to kill, kill the Queen of England at an Angels game, right? So mm-hmm. he knocks the umpire out. He's sitting there behind home plate, and the guy throws a strike, and he doesn't know what to do. And he's like, strike? And the crowd <laughs> goes nuts, right? So then the next is like, strike two. <laughs> then on the third strike, the ball's not even there yet. And he's like, strike three. He starts like moonwalking and <laughs> doing all this kind of stuff. It was hilarious. It was a great, great scene. You're gonna have to watch. You're gonna have to watch it. It's really. Have it's you really ever seen? Done. I saw a couple people in the chat said the scout. Have you ever seen that? Yes. Uh. Well, yeah. which one is that? It, the it's one with um. What's his name? Al- the, uh... Is that the one with Albert Brooks or the one with um? Uh. Wait. The uh. What's his name? I'm trying to think which one the scout the, is because the there's... guy from the Mummy. The guy from the Mummy was Brendan Fraser. Okay, Brendan that's... Fraser's in yes. it as the, as the yes. pitcher, Steve Nebraska. But yeah, Albert Brooks yeah. is the is the trainer is the scout. I keep thinking of there was one with um, what's his name Edward? Is it Edward Alonzo? Uh, what's that guy's name? He's a, uh, but it's a man. What's it called? But he's a old scout. He's like an old school scout, Hispanic guy. I'm trying to remember the name of the movie. I'm, I know someone's. Th- I thought that was better than the scout. The scout was kind of funny, but um, the scout was also very corny. I mean, he's yeah, like I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, miles an hour I didn't enjoy. The other one was a little bit more believable. I yeah. thought that was good. School. Uh, somebody said Trouble with the Curve. That's a really good movie. I enjoyed that movie a lot. That was really well done. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that one was really good. Hector uh, Elizondo. That's who it is. He was in a movie. It was a baseball movie. I want to find um, Hector Elizondo. No, no, it's not him. That's not him. Um, dang it. What's that guy's name? Oh, man. Uh, the lady from... Um, the lady from uh, Goodfellas was in it. She was also in it. She was his. Uh, she was like kind of his girlfriend. I'm trying to remember what the name of it was. So just Lorraine Bracco was in it, and I'm I'm trying. I'm going to go to her and see if I can find uh, the name of the movie. What it was? It was man. What was it called? It was in the ni- Talent for the Game. That's what it was called. Uh, with um, what's his name? Edward James Almos. That's oh. what it was. It was a really good movie, but it was like more of a, a realistic movie where. He goes and finds this kid out in the middle of nowhere, and then the kid becomes big time, and just just how the whole thing worked. I thought that was pretty good. That was pretty good. That was a good. That was a good baseball movie. And he was always eating sunflower seeds. And you know me, Ryan. I'm, I'm a big fan. Yes. Of Someone seeds, said so. Babe with John Goodman. I actually kind of liked that movie, but mm. I I just did not like John Goodman as Babe. Yeah. If I'm being honest, it yeah. was a little over the top. He was never Babe Ruth was never that big. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see here. All right, let's get to some more. I was going to pass some of these because we've got to we've got to kind of wrap this up. This has gone pretty long, and we have a lot of questions in the queue. Yep. Uh, right, we got we get through that one. I'll, I'll get to this one. Robert Bishop, are you guys ever going to finally tell us how you became such devoted Notre Dame fans? I'm bound to determine to get an answer on this. Uh, Robert, we have answered this question yeah, many I times, but but sometimes people join the show new and they're they haven't been on the show as long. So, uh, and he's asked this like three straight shows. So I'm gonna give them throw them the bone ryan you want to go and explain just kind of quickly how you became a notre dame fan yeah yeah robert so for me i had the choice between my so my dad was born in florida he is a miami dolphins fan 
Okay, go into the NFL side of things for a second. My mom grew up a Rams fan. It was the LA Rams at that point. Now it's the LA Rams again. So I had the choice between what NFL team I wanted to root for. I did not have the choice of a college football team. I, I from the moment from the moment I can remember watching a football game, I was rooting for Notre Dame. My dad is a gigantic Notre Dame game. He's been a yeah, Notre Dame fan. He's been to multiple games with me already. He will also be coming with me to the Marshall game uh, for the first home game this year. So I did not I. The, the short of it is I did not have a choice. That's just Notre Dame was in my blood and that's always what it's been. Um, My dad, similar thing. You know, my dad was a Notre Dame fan. So when I was a kid growing up in Ohio, it was either Ohio State and Michigan or, you know, that was it. Right. And I didn't like either one of those teams in football. And so my dad was a Notre Dame fan. And, and when I was a kid, Notre Dame was getting to be pretty good. Like I was lucky to kind of be a fan of Notre Dame in an era where they were really good. Uh, unfortunately for like Ryan's, generation they didn't get to experience it the way we did but like my first year of really remembering notre dame was 1988 so i was 10 so like from 10 to 15 i'm like man this this college football fandom thing is pretty good you know <laughs> being a notre dame fan and i mean i just i loved lou holtz i just loved the rocket tony rice i just fell in love with the team so my dad was a fan but my dad wasn't a huge notre dame fan the way that that i i was he was nfl first he was a redskins fans first and, and I was kind of a – I was already a Broncos fan by then, like already a diehard Broncos fan. So I was a really pro NFL guy. My dad liked Notre Dame. And then when I finally got into college football, I was like, okay, Notre Dame is my team. I just – I love Notre Dame. And I'm I'm now more of a Notre Dame fan than I am a Broncos fan, even after doing this job for a decade, which can make it hard. I mean, when you cover a team for a decade, you know, sometimes you got to you got to learn to put your fan hat uh, – take it off. Well, you have to learn to do that when you're producing and mm-hmm. putting out content. But, you know, you get to know people, and I'm going to be honest with you, it was hard to be a Notre Dame fan sometimes in the last decade just because you're like, I know those people that are doing that, and they're not a good guy, and I can't have a hard time, you know, rooting for them to do be successful. And you get to know the people that, that in a ways that you don't as a fan, and that kind of that kind of made it a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit challenging. So, but that's not the case right now. All right, we have a, a super chat down here uh, from Riza. Riza says, what's your biggest takes on the Notre Dame football program, players or whatever around Notre Dame over the last few years, where you were eventually proved wrong? So a oh. take you had where you are eventually proved wrong. I mean, I've talked about some. I didn't think Kyler Williams was going to be anything more than a, a nice rotation player at running back. I was mm-hmm. definitely wrong on that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that would be one. I it thought – I'm trying to think of some more. What, what are some of yours, Ryan? I mean, I'm thinking of like things that I've missed on, mm-hmm. I guess. It's like a recruiting thing, right? Sure. I mean, like I, I mean, there's some guys like, I mean, there's always, I I think that, you know, for me, it was like Dane Chris that I thought was going to be the next. Yeah, that's thing, a good one. Right. Yeah. Like, I thought he was going to be the dude for a while there, a quarterback. There's been, I mean, there's been a lot of players. Like I don't want to throw people under the bus, but yeah. it's like, you know, that you just miss on some players sometimes, yeah. you know, and it's just like not the same guy that I thought they were going to be type of thing. So I, I thought, I, th- I also thought what's his name? Um, run, uh, his name just escaped me. The running back that kept getting hurts 25 Torian Folson. I thought okay. Torian Folson, his fr- freshman year, I was like, that dude's going to be one of the best running backs in Notre Dame history. I'm like, that's going to be, but I wouldn't guy. say you got proved wrong. I mean, after two years, he was like fourth all time for a Notre Dame running back through his first two years. I mean, you can't, you're not so wrong. Good, guy tore yeah. his knee up. I mean, you yeah. can't, I don't think that I think that's different than, you know, like, hey, I think this guy's going to be really good and he's not, you know, like I, right. I thought Javon McKinley was going to be a stud in his Notre Dame career. And then I, I, I mean, there Max were, Redfield was going to yeah. be a lot better than and the, and, Yeah. And there were extenuating circumstances for Javon injuries and other things like that. I sure. thought Dell Alexander was going to be a pretty good receivers coach in Notre Dame. I did. Mm. I did. Uh, unfortunately, I've not been wrong that often about coaches at Notre Dame. I wish I had been wrong more often, but I have not been wrong. But Dell's won. I thought he was and, – and honestly, I thought bringing Mike Elson back as the D-line coach in 20 – was it 2016 or 17 mm-hmm. was a bad move because I thought – because he didn't do a great job on the D-line his first tenure because he was the D-line coach at first, then moved to linebackers. He was like okay as a D-line coach, but he wasn't great. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think he was going to have the success he had. So that was that was one I was I'm I was glad to be wrong on. You know, the, the, yeah. he was much better his second go around coaching the defensive line. 
We have another super chat from Brandon. It says, do you see, thank you, Brandon. Do you see a possibility of Raritan and Stace being split out wide Eifert style this season? If the wide receiver depth dwindles, any Intel on their positional flexibility? Well, Brandon, we, we did have the one Intel piece where we did talk about Stace a little bit on how they're going to use him this year. But Ryan, I would anticipate the both of them play and they will both have times where they're going to be moved all around. And I do yeah. think they can be used absolutely to supplement receiver depth, but rare has got to get healthy first himself. He's yes. not fully cleared for full tar. He's out there practicing and running, but he's not taken. When I say fully cleared, I mean, fully cleared doesn't mean you're just healthy and practicing. It means, are you practicing at the full volume that you would if you weren't injured and he's not there mm -hmm. yet? Right. I, I think for me, Brandon, I think that both of them give you some flexibility in that department. If Eli Raritan's healthy, and I would love your opinion on this, Brian, like wouldn't he, he seems like that guy that like goal line package, right? Like well, red zone package that you just throw him into the boundary and let him get like some jump balls or something like that. Like he's kind of like that fade dude. You remember how, uh, mm -hmm. do you remember how Stanford used, what was that big tight end they had a couple years ago? The Smith kid? No, not Smith. It was, he was even bigger than Smith. His name will come back to me in a minute, but they would literally. Oh, he wasn't just, their main tight end though, right? He was just a six, eight guy. Is that who you're talking about? I'm, he was their main tight end maybe after Smith left though, if here. I remember correctly. What is that guy's name? But anyway, he, he a was. Bit of a different he, last name, he, correct? He plays He plays for Seattle now. I know that. He's on oh, the Oh, Colby Seahawks. Parkinson? No, it's yeah, Colby Parkinson. Park okay. Yeah. So Parkinson was like 6'8". Like they would just yeah. throw him into the boundary in, in the red zone sometimes. In, in 2018, Ryan, he yeah, had 29 so. catches and seven touchdowns, to your point. Yeah. That was the year and you're referring to. They would just throw him jump balls, man. And like I could see Raritan being used in that department mm -hmm. at times, you know, early on, especially if yeah. he's – if he still get, if he just got back as well too, right? Like you can simplify a role a little bit and just get him some opportunities with that length that he yeah. has, right? So I think he is the easy one for me out of those two that I would see most being like a boundary option as the tight ends. Okay. I have a super chat from Sky Shark four two five. Sydney Albert Johnson was greater than Robert E Lee. Uh, I'd have to think about that one. I would, my gut would be to say, no, I'd want to hear your argument. So present your case, sir, but we appreciate your super chat. Nonetheless, I appreciate that very, very much. Let's see here. we got some more. Uh, we got, we had that one. All right. Uh, I'm trying to find some here that we can get to. Uh, There's been a lot of good questions. Yeah, So man. many good ones. We're just, yeah. I can't go five hours today. <laughs> uh, Archer four five two Brian and Ryan, which Ohio State player on each side of the ball presents the biggest challenge for Notre Dame? Which Notre Dame player on each side does the same for Ohio State? Well, we kind of talked. Well, presents the biggest challenge. So let's let's look at this differently. Presents the biggest challenge for me on we'll go offense for Ohio State, defense for Ohio State, and then we'll go Notre Dame, Notre Dame. So yes. we'll, we'll both offer one. So for me, Ryan, the guy mm -hmm. that presents the biggest challenge on offense for Notre Dame is Trayvon Henderson. I agree with you. I agree. Yeah. If he gets going. You have you don't have much of a chance to to I mean because he you could do all these kind of things to take the receivers out, but then do you expose yourself to getting beat by Trayvon Henderson? That that's mm -hmm. the big one for me. That's the big one yeah. for me. The only other one I would offer up is if actually I don't want to phrase it like that. I think Marvin Harrison Jr. could be a really really dynamic player mm -hmm. potentially, but my answer was also Trayvon Henderson. Yep. He's a different type of cat in my opinion. Defensively, we kind of talked about this. It's like if one of the D linemen goes off. And Tyler Malik, Williams, my yeah, guy. that was yeah. the one we kind of both leaned on. You know, maybe mm -hmm. one of the edges plays out of his mind and the light goes on. But those are the only ones. I mean, you say even if Denzel Burke plays a, a, a great game, he can only cover one guy. Sure. You know, and Ronnie Hickman's a good player, but he's not like a matchup problem. I mean, because he's not taking Michael Mayer out of the game, right? I mean, I'm sorry. Steel Chambers isn't taking Michael Mayer out of the game. So they're not matchup problems. The guy for Notre Dame that I think is the biggest matchup problem for Ohio State is Tyler Buckner, and, and honestly, Tyler Buckner or Chris Tyree. Here's mm -hmm. what I mean by that. Ohio State's linebackers I don't think are great, and and Steele's a good athlete, but he's more of a twitchy in-space athlete, I think. Yeah. I don't know if their athletes and safeties are going to necessarily want to make a living running with Chris Tyree. on. I think they could steal a big play in the pass game with Chris Tyree, much like they've done in the past with him. That mm -hmm. could present some problems, and but but the reason I go back to Buckner is because that would come off of the fact that the linebackers have to defend Tyler Buckner as a runner. That could yeah. open up some opportunities, but um, I, I don't think Michael Mayer is the biggest matchup problem because I think he's the best player. 
Mm-hmm. Ohio State doesn't have anyone that can match him, but they can take Michael Mayer out, in my opinion, much easier than they can defend a, a quarterback who can run around and move all over. And I don't care who the tight end is. That's always true, in my opinion. Yeah. You put the best yeah, tight end in the college football or in, in the NFL and put him on the Ravens, and he's still not going to be as big of a matchup problem as Lamar Jackson athletically. You know what fair. I mean? And yeah. that's kind of the way I look at it. I, I was between Buckner and I was going to mention Mayer just mm-hmm. because I think that the mismatch that he has against guys like Steel Chamber and Ronnie Hickman right. and Josh Proctor, to your right. point, like I think that is a obviously a big right. matchup that you can take advantage of. So yep. he would have been just drop drop his name out there. Yep. See here, uh, oh Notre Dame. I think defensively, uh, defensively, yeah, yeah. I think the the it's Fosky. I mean, I I, I mean, with all I, I could I could throw out Cam Hart and I could throw mm-hmm. out, uh, you know, but I I think Cam Hart's not a matchup problem for Marvin Harrison per se. It's he can kind of neutralize. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you exactly. go. Yeah, uh, you know, Maris schematically could present some problems, but I'm I'd say you know who the only other person I would accept would be Jason Adamuola, yeah, simply Jason's because. I think Ohio State might be better prepared for Foskey at tackle because Dewan James is not a guy that we're necessarily high on, but he's at least long. And then <laughs> we do think Paris Johnson's really talented. He's going to have an adjustment to make the offensive tackle, but he's really talented. For Their sure. guards are solid. It's just, are they good enough to stop Jason Alamiola? I don't know if the answer to that. That's what that'd be the only other one that I think would be an acceptable answer. And it, now that I talk about it, actually may be, may be my number one. Yeah. Just because of the matchup of, because it also, I mean, who the opponent is matters in a matchup difficulty, right? I mean, sure, you know. So I, I, I would actually have to go with Jason on this one. I, to be honest with I would. So I was between those two as well. I would say I'll, I'll say Isaiah if he's matched up against Dewan Jones a lot because those mm-hmm. slow feet are, I don't think are going to eat in that matchup. So yeah, mm-hmm. the more he's on Dewan Jones, the more headaches I think he's going to give Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Savage Cyan Fitness, when it comes to Keeley and Bowen, do you think that a lot of people thinking they are flipping is media-driven because they say they're committed to Notre Dame 100%? Look, it's both. Mm-hmm. When you take visits, and as especially as many visits as Peyton Bowen has taken, and there are extenuating circumstances, which we've discussed, but perception-wise, when you take visits, you know, Keon wants to take officials and all that, that is a legitimate concern, to, reason to be concerned. I think the degree to which a lot of this has been blown up has been very much media driven. Does that mean both are definitely signing with Notre Dame? I'm not saying that. I've never said that. I'm not saying that about anybody in this day and mm-hmm. age. I'm not saying that about anybody. Yeah. And and when Pete Warner flipped to Ohio State, I said if he can flip, anybody can flip at this point in time. You know. So, uh, but I think a lot of it's media driven. Yes, I think a lot of the stuff that we're hearing now is media driven. Yes, it's it's absolutely. it's always like anytime there's these questions where it's one side or the other, it's usually a little bit of both. Like that's just right. usually the reality for me, right? Right. So their actions do cause some pause. Like let's be honest, the visits do cause some pause. But to Brian's point, the media is running away with it a little bit. Like yeah. I do think so. Yeah. Well, and, it, and, are, and some people are being fair, but some people, Ryan, are just honestly between you. Be, you know, we've talked just flat out making stuff up because the, yeah. here's the reason why it sucks in this business because people can say anything, and then just go and say sources said this, mm-hmm. and then wait, well, look, circumstances change, and there's no way to prove that they were lying, right? But we know they're lying, right? Mm-hmm. Or they're talking to somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who cuts the Scott coach's hair, who, you know, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's a lot of it's, but some of the, st- some of the people saying stuff is just flat out making stuff up. Like well, I have been told that a, a Notre Dame commit, I'll say which one has committed to another school. I was told this like three weeks ago, it's flat out lie, this flat out lie, you know? And it's just like, no, that's just a flat out lie. Or it was going to happen like by the end of the week. Remember the one? Where Keon Keeley was going to commit to Florida the next weekend. Remember that one? I I, I know some people, and I'm a source, and I know that and he's going to flip to Florida. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And that, but hey, you know, circumstances change. He changed his mind, and and you can't prove him wrong, right? Because it's a source. You can't reveal your sources. So that ha- and now that on three has arrived, and like them and two four seven are like in a clickbait battle. You know, like nationally, I'm talking national. I'm not talking about Irish Illustrated. I love those, you know, love Tim, Tom, Tim, O'Malley, all those guys. I'm not talking about BGI. I'm not, I'm talking about national people. It's become a clickbait battle. And, you know, because you now have two entities that were created by the same guy with a very similar business model that's driven by 
page views that you, you don't survive in business, Ryan. You don't pay your hundred million dollar investors back mm-hmm. with one dollar subscriptions, right? It's off the ad revenue, which comes from clicks, and that's that's what. We're, and so now it's like, oh no, I can get the most clicks on this off this kid, right. and it's created a it's turned a, a problem that was always there into a much bigger problem, in my opinion. That's my opinion 100%. on the situation. Hundred percent. Marcus Kerr says, are you guys a little concerned with the job Chris O'Leary has done or no context of these? However, lost out on uh, more that would be Devin Moore and Xavier mm-hmm. and Wonkpa settle for Ben um, Hamilton regress settle for Ben. Oh, Ben minute settle Hamilton regress Peyton sliding. Okay. A couple things. There's a couple things in there that I don't accept. Number one, I don't believe Chris O'Leary was the primary recruiter for Devin Moore. They were recruiting him as a corner. I could be wrong on that, but he was one of several coaches that was recruiting him. So, yeah, it's a loss. Xavier Nwankpa is was not on Chris O'Leary. Look, Chris O'Leary had Notre Dame ready to get his commitment. His parents wanted him. There was something else that happened that was out of his control that Notre Dame could never recover from. And uh, settling for Ben Minich, they didn't settle for Ben Minich. He's their third safety in this class. And, and Hamilton regressed. That's on – that's on Kyle Hamilton, with all due respect. Uh-huh. Uh, Peyton sliding, uh, is he right? Like, let's see what if he actually makes a decision. Right. So, in some areas, I do have questions about about Chris O'Leary because I don't necessarily know that Chris O'Leary is the driving force behind the current safety class as it is. Right? I mean, he's a part of it. Uh, in some areas, I thought I thought the safeties were coached pretty well last year. Right? I, I thought mm-hmm. Kyle was actually the least disciplined safety they had last year. You well, know, he- like. He took he took Ramon Henderson in mid what was it like mid-season? and Xavier Watts yeah and, no yeah, it was post mid Ryan he was playing yeah. corner against North Carolina right that was ha- that was the second half of the season to your point and by the end of the season you're like wow going into next year those guys are going to be stars right. with how good he did right. their job with those so yeah <laughs> right. I mean there's right. context to it there's context right. to it. Am I concerned about Chris O'Leary to a degree? Yes. He still has a lot to prove to me as a recruiter. A lot to prove to me as a recruiter. Can he really get his secondary playing dynamic? That's a question mark. Can he get the most out of guys? Still a question mark, but that's a question mark really because he's only been a full-time coach for two years. Yeah. Right? So we haven't seen him go through developing a whole a roster. You know, If Ramon Henderson doesn't take a jump this year, okay, then I'm, I'm a little concerned. But um, – Yes and no, I guess is the way I say it. We we need to see more, especially on the recruiting trail, Ryan. But I mean, so far I think he's done a solid job. Yeah. Can he be better? He needs to be, and we don't know if he will be. But he's done some solid things. I think recruiting is probably where I'm the because forget the Devin Moore thing. He didn't sign a safety last year. Like completely mm-hmm. struck out. That's a concern. And now he's made up for it with Peyton Bowen and Don Schuler and Ben Minich. That's a pretty darn good safety class. I mean, Peyton Bowen, in my view, is a top 30 overall football player. Don Schuler, in my view, is a top 150 overall football player with offers from Alabama and Georgia. So, I mean, so far, so good. He's just got to hold on to those guys because the questions become much starker, much like louder if they don't sign Peyton Bowen, which right. I'm not saying they won't. I'm just saying in to what he had said down there is a the question. Mm-hmm. John Gallagher asks, I'm a, uh, should Manti Teo have won the Heisman Trophy? No, Johnny Manziel was the most dynamic player in college football that year. Yeah, he, he was, was special. He, he was, was. And he you know, went on the road, beat Bama. I mean, you know, he he was pretty special that year. He, he mm-hmm. did, Manti deserved to be second, but the, the best player in college football that year was Johnny Manziel, in my That's opinion. That's fair. That's very fair. Cole Barker, considering the depth of the receiver position, is there a possibility we see the two – well, we kind of answered this one earlier. Um mm-hmm. So, Cole, so I'll, I'll finish reading. Is there a possibility we see two freshman tight ends filling some red zone and more roles, Eli and Holden? Ryan kind of talked about that earlier. Could definitely see a, a role in which they play some red zone, especially with uh, Eli Raritan in the boundary, kind of like Ryan discussed earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ryan Olenek says, hate to be a downer, but if Notre Dame has a mediocre season, 9-3, and three, in both your views, what would be the leading reason why? So if Notre Dame doesn't live up to expectations, what would be their leading reason why? I think number one, yeah. Ryan – is what for you? I would say number one is that the young, young group of players that we are assuming take a big step, the sophomores is mostly what I'm thinking about. They don't take the big step and they're just maybe solid to good football players. and They're not good to very good type of players. So I think that you're mm-hmm. really dependent on a young nucleus this year. So if they don't take a step forward, I feel like that could set you back a, a little bit. Mm-hmm. I think 
when I look at it, Ryan, it's mm -hmm. you have a lot of injuries at key positions. Obviously, can always be one. The quarterback play is not where it needs to be, which could then also turn into injuries. Yep. And you know, I think that the lines aren't as good as we think they're going to be. I think would be the three driving forces behind. And then, of course, the caveat is somebody's way better than we think they're going to be. That could mm -hmm. always be a factor sure. too. But but I, I I think quarterback injuries would be the two that would be the biggest reasons for me. Mm -hmm. Quinn Kelly says, were you guys big on Joe Burrow pre-2019? So I will say I was. Um, and I'm on record as having predicted LSU to be a playoff team in 2019. I really liked Joe Burrow. I thought he had really good talent around him. But when I say I really like Joe Burrow, I thought he could throw for like 3,500 yards and 30 touchdowns, and they were going to have a really good defense. He had great players around him, and they'd go to a playoff game and lose in the first round. That's what I was high on pro Joe. You know, was I big on Joe Burrow? I like Joe Burrow a lot. I had no clue he was going to be what he was. None. None. So, no, yeah. I was I, – I, I would say, yes, I was – but I wasn't big on I, – I didn't – I'm not going to sit there and lie and say that I pretend – I'm going to pretend like I saw coming what came, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought he's going to be a really good player, but not that kind of player. But I thought the really good player was going to do more – because what happened, Ryan, is I really liked the talent LSU had in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I said a lot of things about LSU that I've said about Notre Dame in recent years. Like, if they can finally – and so when they went and got Joe, Joe Brady – and I heard that he was going to open the offense up. And when we saw what they were kind of doing in the spring, and and I thought Joe Burrow was a pretty decent player in 2018. He just played in a crap offense. He was solid. Yeah. But he had really good players around him. I was like, man, if they can turn this guy loose, I think he could be a good player. Again, 3,500 yards, 30 touchdowns. You know, he was a good athlete. He could maybe run for three, 400 yards. I love Jamar Chase as a freshman. I thought Je Justin Jefferson was a good player. And they were going to be great on defense. Well, they weren't great on defense, partly because of their offense. But Joe Burrow was otherworldly, and that I did not see at all. Yeah, I, I was like lukewarm on him, if I'm being completely honest. Like, I thought he was a solid player, you know, like a, probably a good – like a good player for what LSU needed. But I did not see that rise. I didn't. It was – I have never seen anyone take that type of rise in, like, the draft sphere before, man. Like, he went from a guy that maybe was drafted to a guy that was like one of the best quarterbacks I've ever graded, like mm -hmm. in a very quick, it was an insane yeah. rise. Absolutely yeah. insane. Yeah. I, I didn't see that coming. No, I don't think nobody did. I don't think Joe Burrow saw that coming. I mean, if we're being no, honest, you know I mean? Like, not. Um, not. but yeah, I, I did, I did like him coming out going into that year. There's no doubt, mm -hmm. no doubt. All right, Archer four five two is the Notre Dame starting eleven on each side set by now, or are they still legit position battles going on? Are they're still they're not set completely eleven on eleven. There's still a right. lot a lot to to prove. So, Ryan, this is for you, Sam Tyrell. Mm -hmm. uh, will Isaiah Foskey be a top ten pick? It's possible. I would say I think that if he would have came out last year, he was he was definitely a top fifty kid, probably a late first or early second round type player. If he takes a step forward, I believe that from a physical perspective and from a testing perspective he will have a chance to maybe be the second edge off the board i think that will anderson's gonna be a tough guy to unseat in that department but we have know that nfl really goes goes big on some edge players right some pass rushers and if foskey has a big year i think it's possible sam but i'll say top 20 to be a little reserved mm -hmm. on it yep all right got some more here real quick uh nick pope paypal what do you think the first play is going to be against Ohio State? My feeling is play action rollout for a deep shot to Lorenzo Styles. I could dig that. I'd be fine with that. I do yeah. think it's going to be – I said this before. I think it's either going to be a run or some kind of moving Tyler Buckner. Bootleg, sprint out, play Maybe action. Something so, so, yeah, something yeah. something where he gets to move. And it's like a you got one read. It's a post-drag concept, right? And, or, and if it's not there, run it maybe a bootleg with like Loren, you know, clear out and bring Lorenzo or mayor across or something like that, where if it's not, if they cover it, run it, just something to kind of get them going. Uh, and the reason I say run, and I think it'll be a run is because you're, you're establishing the run, but then also if they crowd the box, you see it snap one, it, catching it, throwing out on you know, that quick hit, quick hitch or throwing a bubble or something like that with an RPO. So I think the first run will be a, I think the first play will actually be a run if they, mm -hmm. if, if I had to pick. If they throw it, Ryan, is when I think that they'll get outside of the outside and go with it. So, yeah. Um, 
Uh, BBG should be coach if Tyler does have a big game and we beat Ohio State. Does he play flat the next week? I don't care. I'm fine. Play flat. <laughs> I don't care. They're going to beat Marshall no matter how Tyler Buckner plays. Hey, uh, I'll you be know. in town for that one, so I don't want to see him playing flat. They're going to yeah, – I don't care. If it means beating Ohio <laughs> State, suck it up, Ryan. Take one for that's the team. That's okay? Uh, yeah, that's why you should have brought the hey, RV. Then you could have hung out in the town for the next week and gone to the Marsh Cow game when it will play. Better. Hey, man. Last time I was in town, I had to suffer through the Cincinnati game. Yeah. Okay, Actually, no, that's, okay. that's a lie. Before the spring game, the last yes. time I was in town, I had to yes. – Suffer yes. through the Cincinnati games. Last time you're time for a real game. game. Yes, 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 yes. Yep, I agree. All right, let's get a few more before we get here. Uh, before we get out of here, uh, Tyler Bedwell says, "Are you guys planning on uh, to have a tailgate at Stanford night game? My wife and I are going. I'd love to stop by and meet you guys. So we're going to probably do something for just about every game this year, even if it's something small, uh, even if it's just putting the tent up and having a get together. Hey, I'm in this lot and we're hanging out, just talking and you know, having." Mountain Dews and Waters or whatever. Uh, so, um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Tyler Robinson says, says, hey, Coach Driscoll, I joined the message boards yesterday. It's awesome, though I find it a bit overwhelming at the moment. I'm old and have never been on a message board. I love the Football 101 section, and we do need to start drawing that football section. But, Tyler, thank you for signing up. I'm sure you got my welcome to Irish Breakdown letter this morning. I know I sent that to you. But we appreciate you have, appreciate you being on, on board with us and appreciate the support. Then last question, we're going to go with this, Ryan, is here from Blaine Tiller. Who would you bet on having more touchdowns this season? Michael Mayer and Chris Tyree as a combo or the whole wide receiver room? So does that include receiving and rushing touchdowns for for Chris Tyree? I would imagine it does since he didn't say since he right. He didn't say uh receiving. So so combo touchdowns for Tyree and Mayer or the whole receiver room together. I'll I'll take the former in that one, I guess. I would take Mayer and Tyree, I think, because if we're again if we're counting receiving and rushing touchdowns, mm-hmm. even if Chris Tyree only has let's say five to six, seven rushing touchdowns, I imagine he'll still have a couple on through the air. So on top of what did Mayer have last year, Brian? Seven, six or seven? Sevens? Yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah. in that ballpark. So I imagine he'll still be a big red zone threat this year. So I mean that's working with. I would say that's 15 plus touchdowns between the two potentially, right? So mm-hmm. actually, man, actually, no, I'm switching. Now that I'm kind okay. of doing the math in my head, I'm going to say wide receiver room. Okay. So how many touchdown passes do you think Notre Dame is going to throw this year? I, I think I said before 27 ish, somewhere okay. there, 28. So then we'll add three more for the backups because backups throw touchdowns. So they're going to have 30, sure. 30 touchdowns, 30 mm-hmm. from right in your view. Yep. Michael Mayer gets about how many of those? I'd say eight. Okay. How many go to other tight ends and running backs? Not named Chris Tyree. Touch, just touchdowns? Just, no, pass, uh, they're receiving touchdowns, passing touchdowns to the tight ends and running backs, not named Chris Tyree. About how many of those do you think you'll be? Four. Okay. I'll say four. Okay. How many passing touchdowns do you think Chris Tyree will have this year? I'll say four as well. Okay. That's a number, I think. All right. So that right there is 16. So that would mean 14 touchdowns to the receivers. Mm-hmm. So you think Tyree and Mayer are going to have 12 combined touchdowns receiving, which means Tyree would only need three rushing touchdowns to surpass that. So Don't do math with me. Don't I'm do just, I'm just, because what, what I'm <laughs> saying is kidding. your gut, your gut response was right. That's what I'm, mm-hmm. that's what I'm like. You changed it. Cause you started, you know, I, I understand where you were going with it, but I think your gut was right because of the mm-hmm. st- type of offense. Now here's a question that I have. Does a player like Tyler Buckner or just specifically Tyler Buckner and what we perceive his skill set to be this year, does mm-hmm. that help or hurt Michael Mayer's potential to score more touchdowns? It's a good question. Because there's two arguments there, right? One is uh-huh. it's going to help because having Buckner, teams have to worry about him more, which means great greatly enhances the chances that he finds Mayer open for scores on runs, right? It's not drop it over. The mm-hmm. other, the, the counter is, no, he's going to score more running, which is going to take away right. tight end opportunities for Mayer. That's kind of, to me, the, the balance it, to it. I, I think it may hurt more than help, if I'm being mm-hmm. honest, because I do think that, 
I do think that they may utilize Tyler Buckner's ability as a runner in the red zone. Mm-hmm. Cause I think that that's, I mean, that's a big bonus because you're playing against a lot of man to man in the red zone. And that's, you know, mm-hmm. athletic quarterbacks against man coverage is, is money. So. Mm-hmm. Yep. I agree. So that is going to do it everybody for today's show, man. So Brian, we could have literally gone for two to three more hours. Uh, we could have at least gone for another hour and a half without taking another question. Like you guys brought so many great questions tonight. We appreciate today, I guess. We appreciate y'all very, very, very much. This was a great show, uh, great, enjoyable show. I don't know if we were great, but y'all's questions were great. And hopefully we stepped up and, and were able to, to, to offer the same. But uh, a lot of fun, Ryan. Thanks for being with me today. I appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow. Just make sure you hit that like button, folks. Hit that, hit that uh, notification bell. Hit that subscribe button. We keep doing that every day. We keep doing the same thing where we hit the same thing. Uh, I want to get to the the, the this one because we want you to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast. You know what? I'm just going to let Mace AK do it, Ryan. Join the message board, everybody. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe and the notification bell. Share this podcast. Leave a five-star review. Visit the IB store to get a smooth IB polo or hat. Or we got the banner. We got the, the sweatpants, which is really nice. Falls around the corner. We got the blankets, which are your wife has an IB blanket, correct? She said that's very, very good for hanging out and relaxing and all those type of things. So appreciate y'all very, very much for being with us today. Thank you, Mace AK, for taking us out of here. Y'all have a great rest of your day. We'll see you on the boards. Thank you for being with us on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.